take a roll call um, and we'll get started. Commissioner Cameron. Good morning, I'm here. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Here. Commissioner Zunica. Here, good morning. And Commissioner Stebbins. Good morning, everyone, I'm here. We'll just pause on that for a second. Yeah. <laughs> um, today, um, uh, first, I just want to establish that we are recording this meeting and is being conducted using remote connectivity that's afforded to us through an executive order that Governor Baker issued way back in March that allows public bodies like ours to be able to, to meet um, using um, remote technology. And we've been able to take advantage of that. Um, even today during the middle of this massive snowstorm and um, allowed us to be very nimble in meeting. We've been very appreciative of that. Uh, today is uh, December 17th. It is now uh, 10.03. And for our original commissioners, today is public meeting number 330. And I suspect that that rings a little bit of um, some sentiment for particularly um, those of you who were here at, from the very start. <clears throat> I would just like to make on some initial remarks. <clears throat> it would be an understatement to say 2020 has been a remarkable year and one full of changes. <clears throat> Today marks another milestone. I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, I, I want to restart because I want to get this right. My apologies, a little technical issue for me that I brought up a statement that didn't include what I want to say. So. <clears throat> I would say, and again, it would be an understatement to say 2020 has been a remarkable year and one full of changes. We have seen and we have navigated the impacts of the relentless reach of this virus. We have to pause today and reflect that over the course of the last nine and a half months, we have lost 300,000 of our fellow Americans and now over 11,000 in the Commonwealth to this devastating virus. We have expressed our gratitude and continue to express our gratitude for those on the front line, our medical heroes, pharmacists, grocery delivers, all of those who are at the tellers and the cashiers, the truck drivers, the postal servicemen and postal service women, and of course, all of our first responders. We thank them today. We know that their work will have to sadly continue well into 2021, and we wish them safety and their well being be secure. And we thank them for allowing us to be able to operate so safely from home. But today, I can shift gears now. Today marks another milestone for the MGC. I think that we all knew that this day would come when we would have to bid farewell to one of the MGC's pioneers, Commissioner Bruce Stebbins. And today marks Bruce's final scheduled public meeting as a commissioner here at the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. In a moment, you'll hear from my fellow commissioners, two of whom have served with Bruce for the past eight years. They may decide to express their sentiments privately, but they have the opportunity today if they would like to express their sentiments publicly. But they, they do share publicly, will undoubtedly share the impact that Bruce has had during his tenure as a steady, calm presence on this body. Bruce, you are always a champion for the residents and small businesses of the Commonwealth. You've brought to your work at the MGC a keen understanding of the communities in Western Massachusetts and a commitment to the betterment of our Commonwealth. Over the course of this pandemic, I have been so appreciative of Bruce's leadership as we have navigated an unprecedented crisis. More, but more than anything, and I believe I can say this with great confidence. I am grateful for his caring demeanor and personal investment in every one of the MGC's employees and stakeholders. 
Bruce joins the Cannabis Control Commission in early January, and I know how much they're going to enjoy working with him and benefit from his expertise in highly regulated industries in the Commonwealth. The CCC's gain, though, comes at a cost to us at the Gaming Commission. Your appointment, Bruce, however, is indeed a true win-win for the Commonwealth. The MGC will look forward to welcoming a new commissioner to our ranks in 2021, <clears throat> but I know that I can speak for all of us when I say that Bruce will always hold a place here at the MGC as an honorary member of our team. And for that, thank you, Commissioner Stebbins. And um, I will start with Commissioner Cameron, if you would like to comment now. Um, I sure, do Madam Chair. I do, I, sure, I do want sorry. to let everyone know that Commissioner Stebbins has agreed to come back to visit us in January as well for a little, a, a, another send off. But today is his first formal, his last formal meeting with us, Commissioner Cameron. Yes, and uh, Commissioner Stebbins, you know, it's, it's, I don't have to say goodbye, which is such a nice thing because I know we will be lifelong friends and I will see you many, many times in the future. And that, <clears throat> that friendship is, is really, uh, through mutual respect, years of working together, laughing, uh, I won't say crying, but certainly having some tense uh, moments with the commission. And um, uh, Chairwoman Judd Stein said it well when she said, your calm, steady leadership. And uh, I learned to appreciate that um, early on because that certainly was a different style for me. And, uh, but which we had to learn to appreciate, learn how to work together, learn how to build this commission. And it was, uh, it was an amazing journey, loved, loved it all. When I met Bruce, his, his kids were little girls. They are now high school and middle school young ladies. Uh, I have such a better appreciation for Western Mass and some of the nice uh, restaurants out there due to Commissioner Stebbins. Just the whole, the whole journey has been magnificent. I know this is a great uh, opportunity for Commissioner Stebbins. I'm really happy, happy for him because I know he'll add great value to that new commission, much newer than ours, um, and they are still building. So um, I think the experiences here will only add to, uh, you know, to really add value to the new commission. So again, I am not saying goodbye because I know there'll be many more opportunities um, to get together. So thank you and good luck with the new position. Commissioner Zuniga, I know this is your lunch buddy, so it may be hard, <laughs> hard for you to say, um, public words, but would you like to comment? I, I will. I will. And he and, and I miss. I'm, I'm going to miss uh, my lunch buddy for sure. Um, I'll be brief uh, in order to get uh, to the business of the commission because I know there will be uh, other opportunities as commissioner uh, um, Cameron was saying, as well as you chair, uh, to have a proper send off that includes some funny stories and and other things. But um, I believe that uh, that this appointment is really a reflection on all the work. Um, fantastic work that Bruce has done in, this, uh, in his tenure here and in his experience before. Um, a lot to, to, um, to mention here. Um, if I may say so, I think it's also a reflection on the agency, on uh, the respect that um, the agency has with our appointing authorities, with the public at large, and that comes from all the work that all of us, uh, not, and I, I don't mean commissioners, I mean um, all employees, um, the new commissioners, the, the, everybody that has come and, and, and has been with us, um, I think it's, uh, it's, it, it reflects on, on that as well. Um, the things that uh, now cannabis benefits and the Commonwealth at large benefits are precisely the things that we're going to miss here um, um, in Bruce. Uh, of course, we'll miss his great contributions. Um, of course, not everything was unanimous, but that's part of the deal. Um, we, we're going to miss very much his perspective, um, his collaborative approach, his demeanor, as, as Kathy was saying, his desire to create consensus, and that's very important in the work we do, um, his disarming humor, and of course, his friendship. So well, congratulations, and uh, as, as Gail says, we'll be in touch. Commissioner O'Brien, 
Thank you. Um, to reiterate what everyone else has said too, I, I'm absolutely gonna miss having Bruce next door when we go back into the office. He was one of the first faces that I met when I came down and uh, just like everybody else said, a nice, quiet, calm, steady presence. I, I felt like I got to have an office next door to my big brother who was just that much further ahead in the mission and dealing with kids and dogs and everything else. So I'm, I likewise am confident I'm gonna continue that friendship after he leaves the commission. I think maybe save the story in detail for another day, but anyone who doesn't know the story of how Bruce ended up running for city council in Springfield should really hear the story. It's classic Bruce. Um, but I think it's very fortunate that it happened because I think it started him and committed him to public service. And I think public service has benefited and continues now to benefit from an incredibly intelligent, thoughtful, um, and just fundamentally decent man who is continuing in public service. I think the Cannabis Commission and the Commonwealth will benefit from that. Um, I know we will miss him dearly, but again, you know, we will keep in touch, I'm sure. And, and uh, I've said it to him already, but congratulations, Bruce. Commissioner Stebbins, I know that we have um, further sentiments that executive director will share on behalf of the team, but we'd love to hear from you now. If you'd like to um, comment now, the stage is yours anytime today that you, you want. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm humbled by my colleagues' comments and yours, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I know we have some other people who have dialed in who uh, are anxious to get to the business of the agenda. Um, and I was fully expecting a roast more than, you know, some complimentary thoughts from my my colleagues but um you know i'm 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 happy to have us just kind of move ahead with the agenda and if it's okay i'd be happy to say something as as our meeting wraps up you know what we will allow you to at uh, any time um to share your sentiments so um karen why don't we i guess we'll turn then first off to um item number two which uh our secretary, Commissioner Stebbins, um, will have you will have you lead on. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my colleagues, in your packet, you have the uh, minutes from the November third, twenty twenty meeting. Uh, first of all, let me say uh, a big thanks to uh, Shara Bedard, who I know is also uh, winding up her tremendous tenure with the MGC. She has been a, a, a great colleague to work with. Uh, I know that. Uh, she is working very hard to get uh, some uh, some back meetings all caught up, and I'm going to have a chance to review those and make sure that they're in the appropriate hands uh, for review at a future meeting. But uh, I just want to thank her for her good work um, and, and really, really working hard over these last few weeks to to get caught up, so uh, she doesn't leave this for someone else. But um, in your in your meeting package, you have November 3rd, 2020 meeting minutes. I would move their approval as always subject to any uh, corrections for typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Second. Thank you. Did everyone have a chance to review them? Yeah, and of course it's the, the hearing uh, for the, um, any comments, suggested edits? All set? Then I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. Then I vote yes. Shara? 5-0. And I'm going to miss saying that to you. Um, I, uh, real quickly, on behalf of all of us, uh, Shara, um, thank you so much for your, uh, your work. You pivoted during to the remote. Um, world so so well and have been a partner to support me th throughout technical challenges. Folks don't know that Shara is sometimes a little scribe to me to remind me of things. So I have um, very much appreciated all of her support. I also know Shara has a very exciting opportunity. She also is going to stay with the state um, at the, in the Commonwealth. And so again, our loss, but a win for the Commonwealth. So we'll, we'll Thank proceed. You. Thank you. And, and I, I think then that's a good segue to uh, item number three, Karen, for the administrative update. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so before getting into the official agenda item, I did want to briefly, briefly comment on behalf of the MGC staff about the departure of Commissioner Stebbins. First of all, Bruce, congratulations on your new appointment. Uh, but above all, I'd like to thank you for all you've done as a leader in this organization over the last eight and a half years. Uh, I would like the public to know just how beloved Bruce is by the entire team here. Uh, Bruce has a special way of connecting with members of the staff in all different divisions and on a personal level. I routinely saw him checking in with different people in the organization, working to make their jobs better and furthering the mission of the agency. Uh, one of those people, a gaming agent a supervisor, Eric Cantel, wrote Bruce a note that I was CC'd on upon learning of his departure. And I, read permission, I received permission from him to share it today because I thought it was important to communicate how the staff, uh, the heart and soul of the organization felt about you, Bruce. And that reads, Dear Bruce, I wish you all the best in your new position. From the beginning, you made everyone in the room feel welcome. I will miss your calm, your confidence, your poise, your assurance. You exuded such knowledge and commitment to the MGC. I want you to know you will be greatly missed and virtually impossible to replace. Please frame the certificate for winning the first poker tournament. All the best to you and your family. Sincerely, Eric. So Bruce, it has been my honor to work for such a good and decent man. We will all miss you very much. And to the people that work at the Cannabis Control Commission, you are so lucky. So I just wanted to um, just say a, a few words. As, as Kathy mentioned, we'll have more time to talk to you about your uh, the thanks we have for you and, and your new position going forward with the staff. Um, first item on the administrative update is a staffing update. So as Kathy mentioned today, not only do we have the departure of Bruce Stebbins, but also we are recognizing the departure of our paralegal, Sharon Bedard, who has been so instrumental in making sure that these remote public meetings are successful. Uh, Shara worked in the IEB before going over to legal, and I still remember interviewing for her position and how she knocked that out of the park. So it's no surprise she has been scooped up by EOHHS. So before turning it over to her boss to say a few words, uh, I would like to say thank you, Shara, for all you've done for this organization. We're going to miss you very much. So I'll turn it over to Todd just for that staffing update. Well, thank you, Karen, and uh, good morning to everyone. And uh, hello, Shara. I appreciate the opportunity to publicly uh, offer a, a farewell message. And Shara, it's always difficult to say goodbye to a person uh, who's been such a positive presence and a fixture in one's life for so many years. And this is certainly the case for me when it comes to you. However, any sorrow I may be feeling is certainly tempered by the knowledge that you're getting a chance to pursue a really great career opportunity and undertake an interesting new challenge. I'll always be grateful uh, to you and admire the tremendous time and effort you invested in really uh, understanding every aspect of your job so that you could produce a really first class work product. There's certainly no one who works harder than Shara does. And she was, she's was she been responsible for many areas that may be considered the sausage making end of our legal duties, meaning we all ultimately see a really nice finished product, but don't always realize the incredible effort that went into getting it there. Uh, this often involves largely unheralded or celebrated work, but work that is uh, important nonetheless, really important and legally significant. Um, for example, there's a tremendous amount of energy that goes into producing the written minutes of these commission meetings, which Shar has done and done well for quite some time. Not only does it require careful attention to detail, but the ability to synthesize into a few written pages what is often hours of complex policy and legal discussion. And Shara has uh, also overseen the regulation adoption process. And what some may not fully appreciate is that when the commission moves to vote a draft regulation through the, the process, it involves navigating a complex maze of legal requirements that includes the preparation and filing of a wide array of legal documents with a variety of different authorities, all on a very rigid time schedule. Um, it's not a process that's for the faint of heart, but Shara has been able to traverse this difficult terrain tremendously well over the years, oftentimes under some really exceptional circumstances. The list goes on, but those are just two examples of the contributions you've made to this agency that I, for one, will always really appreciate. So thank you for your tremendous diligence to the position. But more than that, 
thank you for being such a thoughtful, conscientious, and valuable contributor to the commission. And of course, thank you for being a friend. I um, miss so much about having you here as part of our team, but you can know that as you depart, you've left this place a better place than you found it. And I wish you and your beautiful family only good things moving forward. So thank you, and I wish you a fond uh, farewell and hope to keep in touch. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so um, I do just want to say um, thank you so much for, for the e-card. That was, that was really nice of everybody. Um, and uh, thank you to Katrina for, for making that happen. And um, so um, I also just want to say, uh, Todd, thank you for being one of the best bosses I've ever had. And this experience that um, I've had at the Gaming Commission um, has helped me really grow um, professionally and um, personally. And I get to take that with me. So that is, that's invaluable. And, um, and I still want to, you know, once things get back on track, I still would like to meet up and celebrate milestones with the commission and all that. Um, and I'll be, uh, I'll be right down the street. So, and if anyone needs me, I'll, um, I'll uh, forward my personal phone number and email <laughs> so you can keep it. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Shara. Okay, so next on the agenda item 3B is the on-site casino update. Uh, as you're aware, on December 8th, Governor Baker announced uh, COVID-19 Order 57, uh, which took effect on November 13th. That order enhanced some restrictions, including gathering limits. Uh, however, it did not impact the current casino operations. Uh, that order not furthering limiting uh, further limiting casino operations specifically uh, is consistent with the recent case of DeRosier versus the governor, which was issued on December 10th, where the SJC upheld the governor's use of emergency powers exercise under the Civil Defense Act to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. That um, case did note that uh, casinos are highly regulated by the Gaming Commission. Massachusetts only had three casinos and the high level of regulation uh, to lessen the risk of the spread of COVID-19 that that stuff suffices as a reason for the governor to replace the entities in different phases. Uh, it, clearly, the pandemic and the restrictions are getting wearisome, uh, but we know, especially now, that we still need to require a high level of compliance by the licensees and cooperation by casino patrons. This is not the time to let up. We need to hang in there a little while longer uh, as the public health experts are advising. So I'm going to turn it over now to Loretta Lulios and Bruce Van uh, for further updates on what's happening at the casinos. Okay, thanks, Karen. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners, and good morning, Commissioner Stebbins. Uh, generally, since the last update that we gave two weeks ago on December 3rd, there's continued to be broad compliance with uh, the COVID health and safety measures by the three licensees, as well as by the patrons. We're now in week six of the required early close, closing period. Prior to the week six, all three licensees were on a 24-7 uh, schedule. And now, as you know, they are closing nightly no later than 9.30 p.m. And the hotels remain closed at Encore and MGM. I worked on at on site at Encore last Friday and walked the casino floor at around 5.30. I saw firsthand from the time you got into the elevators in the garage, the signage, the markings on the floor for distancing, uh, security protocols as you entered the casino floor. I went in and out a few times to several security stations and noticed you know, the, the consistent uh, protocols coming through. Uh, the sanitizer throughout the property, the plexiglass where it was supposed to be at the uh, slot, uh, dividing the slot uh, positions and at the, uh, uh, at the table games, chairs removed uh, at slots and table games, allowing the distancing 
mask compliance by staff and patrons throughout, no one walking around uh, with beverages. Uh, so generally those were my observations and have been the reports that we've gotten over the past couple of weeks. I I'd like to ask uh, uh, Bruce Band to uh, give you some specifics of what his team has been observing uh, over the past couple of weeks. Uh, yes, uh, over the, the past several weeks, we've kind of observed uh, uh, the casinos really haven't exceeded uh, capacity limits. They've all remained uh, actually below 50% uh, at all three properties. Uh, bottlenecks like elevators and things have not been an, an issue. Security's done a good job of keeping the separation. Uh, there's always, you know, minute problems, but they've taken care of those uh, uh, quickly and correctly. Uh, the casinos have been uh, uh, keeping up with having the patrons uh, keep their masks on and, and uh, you know, keeping the separation in, in any line or anything like that, especially with promotional giveaways, which tend to be uh, problematic. And uh, they've done an excellent job with that. Uh, the closings at 9.30 have been going well. They've been getting the patrons out on, in a timely fashion. And uh, overall, they've, they've done an excellent job with uh, all the, the protocols. Okay, great. Um, so if there are no questions uh, about those general measures, I did want to report on the um, reported positive COVID cases that we have uh, been notified of from the, from the casinos. Uh, it's no surprise that we would see uh, positive cases being reported consistent what, with what is uh, happening uh, in the Commonwealth throughout the nation. Um, as you know, the casinos are required to notify the IEB whenever they become aware of an employee who has tested positive for COVID-19. They also notify the Board of Health and their uh, respective community. They've taken that responsibility seriously and responsibly. And as part of that uh, discourse with an affected employee, uh, they have uh, consistently mobilized to temporarily close and deep clean affected spaces uh, where that's appropriate. appropriate. They've conducted their own contact tracing through discussions with the employee and through utilizing the significant surveillance tools that they have. Follow all CDC and DPH guidelines in their personnel policies around COVID leave and testing before returning to work of an affected employee. Uh, they have measures that are part of their plans for stringent back of the house training and signage and hygiene and mass compliance and distancing. And they are taking steps on a continuous basis to ensure that the employee population follows all of those health and, health and safety guidelines. So to date, over the past approximately six months since the requirements to notify went into effect on June 23rd, we have been notified of a total of 80 positive cases arising in casino employees. It is notable that employees have largely indicated that they believe they contracted the virus outside of work, usually reporting that they believe they contracted it from a household member. This number, this 80 number, is across all three properties and dates back to the past, uh, over the past six months. Um, I, I'd like to try to give some context to the uh, 80 number. Um, uh, so over the past six months since reopening and since they've been reporting, the number of active employees across all three properties has ranged from approximately 4,400 active employees to approximately 6,300 employees. And that range is attributable to you know, the reopening happened, then amenities were added, um, the hotels uh, were opened, uh, Encore opened its hotel, MGM opened on a restricted uh, basis. Uh, and uh, now, um, uh, you know, the nine, there was the 24 seven operating period, now we're back to the 930 um, closures. So all of those changes affected employee staffing. So that's why I'm, I'm giving the range. Um, notable again that while on property, uh, employees remain masked subject to the sanitization rules. 
Also, we have seen no concerning trends in employee population concentration of any outbreaks in any on-site area areas of the casinos. Uh, so generally, we thought it was important to report that number to you uh, now and uh, would try to answer any questions that you might have about that. Questions? Uh, fellow commissioners, C Commissioner Cameron. Yep, just, just a comment. Um, certainly that number is um, uh, concerning. We, uh, you know, anyone that contracts this virus, it, you know, we're, we're concerned about and these are uh, casino employees. But I think the important part of your um, report was this vigilance with compliance, meaning uh, that both, you know, all of our licensees are in fact really vigilant about the compliance measures that are in place. So it seems to me that they are taking it very seriously, um, although it is, it is um, concerning that um, some employees have have uh, contracted the virus. Other questions or comments or observations? Commissioner. Yeah, yes, if I may, um, a great report. Thank you, uh, Lorena. I guess um, we'll continue to have this like we have been doing the, in, in, in recent weeks. And, and what you uh, suggest is important in, in, your, in your report is to look at trends or look for trends that may be worrisome uh, given all the efforts that we that we have and, and that we know are, are in place. So thank you for that report and uh, we'll stay tuned. Loretta, if I could just add, um, you're also confident in the protocols that the licensee takes once they understand an employee has been, um, is contagious or has contracted the virus? Uh, so they, they do follow CDC guidelines. They have COVID leave policies. Um, and you know, all of the reporting that's been done to me is that those policies have been implemented uh, consistently with every uh, report uh, that they have. There also are instances where the positive person uh, lives with another casino employee who is not at the time positive. Uh, consistent with the public health guidelines, uh, personnel policies uh, place that person on COVID leave as well, you know, the, the, ho the other household member on COVID leave uh, as well uh, with the testing requirement before return. Uh, so every notification I get is accompanied by, uh, you know, that kind of detail uh, if, um, uh, if impacted in that way. Uh, so it appears, you know, by all, um, all of the reporting makes it apparent that they're taking their responsibility on uh, these communications with the employees and with their reporting obligations seriously. Thank you. Any further questions for Loretta on this part of your report? I don't have a question, more of a comment uh, in line with the other comments that have been made, which is what one of the things that I've been most interested in each time we get this number update is the contact tracing and the indications consistently appear to be primarily, if not universally, community spread as the reason for the positives. Uh, and I am um, pleased with what appears to be the effectiveness of the rules and the compliance that we put in place and the compliance by the licensees. Even as cases are going up statewide, uh, it does seem to be consistent that um, those measures have been, you know, relatively effective in terms of making sure there isn't continued spread. And the policies, Loretta, you just talked about in terms of supporting the employees to make sure that that continues. Um, has enabled the casino industry to continue forward during all of this. So I, I thank you for it. I, I, I'm interested to hear the numbers every time you come forward with it. Great. Thank you. Loretta, do you want to continue? Sure. Uh, so next I wanted to report to you that on December 4th, uh, the IEB issued a notice of non-compliance to Encore relating to over-service of alcoholic beverages to patrons on three instances, on August 2nd, August 29th, and September 4th. 
this was the first notice of noncompliance regarding alcohol uh, to Encore. And all the no although the notice issued in early December, and I'm reporting this to you now, each instance was addressed in real time in August and September by the IEB with the casino, and measures were put into place uh, at, at the time. All three instances shared a common fact pattern and involved over-serving alcohol to a patron who in each instance should not have been served. In the August 29th instance, our investigation established that the signs of intoxication would have been observable when the last drink was served to the patron. He was served his last drink at 3.09 in the morning. This was when 20, obviously when 24 uh, our operations were in effect and he soon thereafter fell after getting up from his seat at a slot machine, hit his head, and was tended to and evaluated by casino first aid uh, before being escorted to safety. The other two instances uh, violated a rule that is codified in the internal controls and the rule states that no more than three drinks can be served to a patron in one hour. In one instance, four drinks were served in an hour. In another instance, five drinks were served in an hour. In the August 2nd inst inst instance, the individual appeared intoxicated after the service of the last drink, and he was aggressive to a server and disruptive at the cage. In the September 4th instance, the individual also appeared intoxicated after the service of the last drink, he uh, confronted another patron, refused at that point to comply with the mask policy, and ultimately was placed under arrest by the GEU for disorderly contact, uh, conduct. So the beverage license is tied to the gaming license, and the commission has always uh, put a high priority on enforcing adherence to the rules around the service of alcohol. There's mandated training, specific internal controls, monitoring and reporting all built into the enforcement mechanisms and for obvious public safety reasons. And the issue takes on an additional dimension in the midst of this pandemic because public health also depends on patrons adhering to the masking, distancing, and hygiene measures that are put into place. And you know, obviously intoxication can interfere with a person's compliance with those safety measures and puts um, people like security and our GEU members at a heightened risk when they are then called on to uh, interact with, uh, with those individuals. Uh, so over services uh, unacceptable at, at any time uh, and uh, you know, at this time as well. The IAB wanted to go on record with the formal notice of non-compliance so that if this happens again, a monetary fine uh, would be available. As you know, the notice of non-compliance is a prerequisite uh, to, uh, to a fine. So as I mentioned, measures were put into place right away. More comprehensive measures were directed by the IEB and uh, uh, multiple measures were put into place on Encore's own initiative. And I would like to ask uh, Bruce Band and Senior Enforcement Counsel Kate Hardigan uh, to talk about Bruce, to talk about what measures were put in place right away, and Kate to talk about uh, where where we are now uh, with the measures in place. Uh, what, if I could ask what, you. Please. When we have an a incident like this, we complete our review for we know all the facts. And uh, my staff and, and myself meet with the compliance uh, uh, director on site. We give them all the information and the facts and let them start to take action to correct this as soon as possible. Uh, they usually start to uh, do, do uh, some, some retraining on the tips uh, training and do uh, disciplinary action with the employees and then start to put in uh, additional steps uh, to correct the, the problem. And I will have Kate uh, continue with her section. Good morning. Good morning, Kate. Um, it's nice to see everybody. So as uh, Loretta mentioned, um, in the notice, uh, we did specify several recommendations and they can be broken down into four primary categories. Uh, the first being training, the second being internal controls, 
Um, there were some recommendations around physical improvements and also um, just we asked for specific information about discipline. Um, and I will review uh, what's been done by Encore um, and what they have agreed to do uh, pursuant to the information and the notice. First, with respect to training, um, there have been additional uh, training pieces put into place uh, by Encore at this point. They are in the process of implementing additional uh, training measures, specifically mandatory monthly quizzes uh, to test several levels of staff who are responsible for alcohol service or who may come into contact with patrons who are consuming alcohol. Um, these include cocktail staff, front of house restaurant personnel, butlers, pit bosses and uh, above level managers, slot supervisors, beverage managers, and also restaurant managers. Um, and in addition, uh, Encore has taken the step of having their assistant director of beverage certified as a TIPS trainer. Uh, so TIPS, for those of you who may not be familiar with that acronym, is Training and Intervention Procedures for Servers of Alcohol. This is a certification uh, you can receive when you are someone in the service industry who serves alcohol. So Encore now has on-site um, an assistant director who's actually a, a trainer for this program, allowing them to implement um, refreshers of tip, tip training um, without having to send uh, parties off site necessarily. Um, so that was a proactive step taken by Encore with regard to training. Um, we also asked that in addition to this enhanced training, uh, that there be enhanced communication between uh, the service staff um, and Encore has taken uh, steps not only to make sure that service staff have been retrained on how to communicate um, when they're uh, crossing over shifts or handing off shifts so that if someone is taking over service of the patron, they're speaking with the server who has uh, provided uh, perhaps uh, alcohol to that, to that patron uh, prior, earlier in the evening. Um, and that pairs with the internal control. In addition to servers making observations and communicating them to their fellow staff, um, it's important that pit bosses and uh, floor managers are also aware and making significant observations about uh, responsible service of alcohol and potential over service. And to that end, Encore has agreed to implement an internal control um, that would require pit bosses and floor managers to make hourly rounds um, of their areas of responsibility and to make observations, uh, not only of patrons who are consuming alcohol, but to communicate with uh, table games dealers as well. Um, we realize that table games dealers in their um, position have a unique perspective on patrons uh, and their consumption of alcohol. So we think that's a valuable perspective. Um, so that internal control um, will be forthcoming. The third area identified in the notice was uh, physical improvements that may help with responsible service of alcohol and monitoring of alcohol service. Um, and there have been several physical improvements made and some uh, in, in the future, uh, which Encore is undertaking at this point. Um, so regarding uh, physical improvements, there are now watch boards. These are in the form of uh, whiteboards uh, with markers that at each service area that uh, servers can note down the description and location of the patron who may have a particular concern about regarding over service of alcohol. And this allows it to be communicated to other members uh, of the service staff who are on their shift. Um, in addition to this, um, which uh, is a, a fairly basic method of communication, Encore is undertaking at this point to uh, investigate how to digitize this communication so that it can happen more quickly and efficiently across service areas uh, around the gaming floor. And uh, the last area identified was uh, discipline. And in review of the response to the notice, uh, Encore has completed a thorough and appropriate disciplinary review across all three of these incidents. Um, as uh, Bruce Band shared, uh, this is something that is done uh, you know, oftentimes prior to the issuance of a notice, and Encore has shared the details of this disciplinary review with the IEB pursuant to the request made in the notice of noncompliance. Um, that's a brief summary of the four areas uh, of primary recommendation that were in the notice. And if there are questions, I'm happy to um, answer them and would also note that uh, Jackie Crum is on the call as well. And she's been um, aware of this and communicating with the IEB in response to the notice. Thank questions. you, Kate. Thank you, Bruce. Questions? Good morning. Good morning, Jackie. Uh, questions for um, Kate on, on Loretta on, on, on this issue. I have one Commissioner question. Karen? Yes. Yes. Um, you just laid out, uh, all three of you, uh, an extensive, what appears to be an extensive plan of 
uh, actions to rectify this serious issue. Um, in your opinions, is it um, uh, did the licensee take this uh, this uh, these issues seriously enough, and um, they're doing everything? It sounds like to um, to make sure something like this is not reoccurring. But are are the uh, actions appropriate in your opinions? And um, um, it sounds like to me that they are, but I'd like to hear from the experts. Yeah, I don't think there's any question by any of us that's been involved in this matter that you know the licensee has been uh, very responsive and has uh, shares our view that this is not acceptable behavior and that uh, considerable efforts have to be made uh, to, um, you know, minimize any uh, chance that this uh, is a recurring uh, thing. And, you know, the licensee knows its operation uh, better than anybody. And uh, some of the measures uh, were identified uh, by them uh, and, you know, were put into uh, place uh, bef well before the notice uh, issued. Um, you know, one of the uh, significant measures uh, that, um, uh, you know, had, I, I discussed at some length with, uh, with Bruce uh, was uh, putting uh, some responsibility through the internal control uh, with the uh, pit boss, the slot supervisors, and the floor uh, people. Uh, which is a, a, a change. Uh, and we think that that also will be uh, an effective measure. Um, but by all accounts, uh, we think that there's been a comprehensive response, a responsible response um, uh, from the licensee. Thank you. Commissioners, lean in or, or, or wave if you would like to. Sure. Okay, Madam, thank you. Madam oh, Chair. Commissioner Stebbins, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, just, uh, just a quick question, I guess, for, for Loretta or Kate. Uh, the, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the drink limitation is something that is somewhat unique uh, when it comes to the issuance of an alcohol license and that, you know, we've spelled it out specifically that, you know, no more than three drinks in an hour. All of our licensees have, have agreed to that, uh, that serve alcohol. I, just confirming is that the is that the case that that's right that is consistent uh, across all three all three properties and it's a you know essentially it's a um, uh, part of the beverage license agreement which is tied to the gaming license so um, uh, that is the uh, limit across all three licensees yes okay obviously um, you know, a couple of these instances kind of became um, disruptive instances on the gaming floor, and it appears they were all addressed with, with licensee staff and GEU appropriately. Um, you know, I think it goes without saying that our licensees are still, you know, are seriously committed to making sure that somebody who has uh, perhaps been overserved, and hopefully, you know, that case won't come up again because there are, um, uh, some impacts from this notice, some non-compliance, but, um, you know, I think they're all committed to making sure that nobody ever leaves the property, uh, you know, having been overserved. And I think a couple of our licensees have made even uh, rides or something available to make sure people are getting home safely if, in fact, they are overserved and do leave the property. But I think a combination of this notice of non-compliance, all the steps that they've taken, as well as what they've offered to do for their, you know, for their patron safety, um, I think, hopefully, will be enough that uh, we won't have too many of these incidents again. Right, and I do note that uh, the last incident was the beginning of September, um, uh, and uh, you know, again, reporting to you now on it, but. Uh, you know, there has been some passage of time uh, uh, since this over, over service issue. Um, uh, you know, it hasn't repeated since the beginning of September. Yeah. Uh, Loretta, Thank though, you. just to clarify, uh, the, 
and I and I want to get to Commissioner Zuniga. <clears throat> I noted Commissioner Cameron said a plan of action, but again, after the good work of our gaming agents under the leadership of Bruce Band and our GEU uh, on the initial, and then uh, you know back in August, measures were corrective measures were immediately put in place. They just have been improved and enhanced over time, and that that plan of action continues and will be fully implemented given your investigation. Is that fair? That yes, that's well, that's well said. That's exactly accurate. Okay. All right, uh, Commissioner Zuniga. Uh, well, I was actually gonna ask precisely that question uh, or along those lines. Also thank uh, the team, uh, Kate, Loretta, for the thorough report. It sounds like there's quite a bit of um, measures that are already um, in place and some that might evolve as you yourself alluded to um, in uh, whether digitizing some information uh, or uh, the, the licensee themselves um, identifying additional measures in collaboration with, with uh, Bruce's crew. So um, look forward to uh, additional updates on, on this matter but thank you for, for the report. Commissioner O'Brien. I, did, I just had one question, which um, when it comes to, Kate, you mentioned that there's going to be some level of training or increased training for the table games dealers in terms of identifying over-serving. Um, uh, when, when I was hearing about this in, in more detail recently, Bruce Band pointed out there is a rotation schedule for the table dealers. And so they're not, you know, it's not static. They're not stationary necessarily seeing this person you know, become more inebriated as the night goes on. Is part of the training going to be sort of as the table gets passed off to the next dealer? If there's anybody they think is on the cusp or they've noted anything, does that then get conveyed to the next dealer? So table games dealers were one of the categories specifically identified um, in the response as um, subject to the mandatory monthly quizzes about responsible alcohol service. The table game dealer interaction came more in line with um, having the um, internal control reflect pit bosses and floor managers to make hourly rounds. We want them specifically to interact with the table games dealers because the cocktail servers are moving um, to multiple patrons and in multiple areas of the floor, the table game dealers rotate with um, perhaps less frequency and will have a more consistent interaction with the group of people at their table. So we wanted um, the pit bosses and floor managers to take advantage of that perspective in addition to what they may get from the watch boards and from specific um, cocktail server staff. Um, so apologies okay. if that was, if that was no. unclear. No, no, that clears it up. But it, I guess my question is still out there, which is as part of that, should there also be efforts made that um, when the pit bosses are checking in, if they say, look, I'm watching, you know, player seven at that, um, that table, that that gets conveyed to the dealer that comes in. Certainly. And I, I think, uh, oh, apologies. Um, I think that is uh, the general spirit of trying to enhance communication in the shift handoff between the, the service staff and, and any personnel who are on the gaming floor. Um, and these watch boards, as I said, are, um, you know, an initial effort and, and um, certainly um, Encore has identified some more efficient ways to make sure that information is communicated more broadly across all areas of the gaming floor. I, uh, I was just going to ask about everything going on at the table gets passed off when, when people relieve each other from a patron's play to anything else going on, if the patron's problematic or, or anything. So that would get passed off when they make a switch. Great, thank you. You're welcome. And, and just so that I'm clear, Bruce, is that memorialized in the internal controls? I will make sure it is, because that has not been submitted yet at this point. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, are there any other comments or questions? I just want to um, first say that I was very pleased to hear uh, that uh, about the vigilance of our of our eyes at the uh, casino floor that are you know through the eyes of our gaming agents as well as our GEU. Uh, they intercepted this activity and they did make recommendations and work with the licensees to put in place important measures at that time. I want to uh, thank uh, the investigative team under 
um, first, uh, really, uh, it was a crossover under Karen and then Loretta and, and with a good work of Kate, to be thorough. Um, Loretta noted the dates of these matters. We always want to be cognizant of timing. I also want to be um, cognizant of the fact that this is a significant notice uh, for our licensees that that must be taken with uh, with care because it is significant to their record. And so uh, today um, marks a, a serious note for Encore. And um, I am looking forward to um, being able to have reports from IEB about how these measures are, have been implemented, enhanced, and then tested. So um, I'm sure that we will get follow-up reports in the future. I also am quite confident because I have confidence in, in um, the folks at, at Encore that they will take this notice today with the very seriousness that all of our team has taken it. So um, I think the, the test lies ahead to make sure that all these measures work. Of course, not only are we always concerned about this, but not only for the patron safety, but as Commissioner Stebbins alluded, you know, a, a patron who somehow inadvertently gets behind a steering wheel. Complicated, of course, are that the stakes are too high for non-compliance with the COVID-19 measures. And so um, this is an extremely important uh, conversation to have today for us to really hear the full complement of measures being taken with respect to overserving. And I, th I thank you, uh, Loretta and, and team, for today's thorough report. Um, I don't want to put you, Jackie, on the spot, but you are here. And of course, if you would like to chime in, Loretta, is this the proper time for Jackie to chime in or would you prefer? Uh, no, I think this is perfect. Okay, ja Jackie again. Um, so thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Chair, um, we absolutely share your concern that over service is never acceptable at any time. And I can reassure you that we cut people off uh, on a daily basis. Many, many people get cut off. So it's something that we are watching. I think with any incident, you learn and you grow. And I think that's what happened here. Uh, what we've realized is that we need to increase communication primarily between our gaming departments and our beverage departments. And I think that's, that's what we're trying to put in place now to really uh, add another layer of protection. Thank you. Commissioners, any further uh, comments, questions on this matter? I know, Loretta, you have a third item, I believe. I do. So shall I jump right into that, Chair? Sure. Okay. So the other matter arose on the night of Sunday, December 6th at Mystique, a restaurant located at Encore. Mystique is operated by the Big Night Entertainment Group as a vendor licensed by the Commission to conduct business with the casino. And Mystique has been authorized to operate as a restaurant under the state's restaurant guidelines. So on the night in question, Sunday the 6th, there was larger than usual attendance at the restaurant and restaurant management explained that this was due to a late afternoon Patriots game and what management termed an industry night for professionals in the hospitality industry. And that type of event, uh, which was on that night largely reservations based, was authorized under the restaurant guidelines. The IEB did a comprehensive review of the surveillance footage of the evening. And of course, we are familiar uh, firsthand with the layout of the restaurant itself. And I mentioned the layout because the configuration of the restaurant, I think, comes into uh, play uh, in some of the issues that they had on the night in question. So. There is a dining room in the restaurant with typical dining tables, but the area in question uh, has a bar, which this bar had appropriate plexiglass separations, and bars are allowed under the state guidelines so long as prepared food is served. This part of the restaurant also has a long, narrow, high top table with bar height chairs at it that is located directly behind the guests who are seated at the restaurant's main bar. What unfolded here as the evening progressed is that the setting looked less like a typical dining 
sit down restaurant setting and more like an informal gathering. Some guests did not remain seated at their dining spot and rather they walked around the area socializing with other guests who were seated at these two bars. Some guests were unmasked and walking around with their beverages. Some unmasked guests were walking right up to servers and not maintaining the six foot distance. The passageway between these two bars that I described was a narrow area and on that night it was a high traffic area and they did not maintain a single direction flow of traffic in that area that night. So there was not strict adherence to the mass requirements and there was not strict adherence to the six foot distancing requirements. In the continuum of behaviors, this was not a wild overcrowded party. In fact, it was not a matter of being over capacity uh, or having an over capacity crowd. It was people walking around unmasked, visiting with one another in close contact with one another and with staff in more of what you, you describe as an informal social gathering setting. Now it is worth noting what the restaurant did that night. They recognized that this was not an ideal situation and they closed the restaurant early. The lights went on at around 8.30 and the last guests were leaving by 9.10. As of Monday of this week, the 14th, management on its own volition closed the restaurant until further notice expected sometime in 2021. Uh, the decision by management to close uh, on their own really uh, makes moot any corrective action that the IEB would otherwise have taken. It was a, a, a responsible measure uh, that they took at this difficult time. Uh, so the management also, I should note, they were very cooperative with both GEU and the gaming agents. They made their management teams available uh, to us and assisted in making the surveillance footage um, available efficiently and, and thoroughly. And uh, again, I thought it was important to report this activity to you. It's not the type of activity that we have been seeing or uh, that can be tolerated. Given the actions that were taken, which I think were responsible actions. The only thing that the IEB uh, would expect with the eventual reopening of Mystique is that the reopening be subject to the IEB review and approval, uh, give the IEB the opportunity to assess uh, any uh, health measures that are still required um, at the time of reopening. Um, especially around the configuration uh, issues. Uh, so th those are my prepared remarks on, on Mystique. And, um, you know, I know we have folks uh, on this call, um, myself and others who can try to answer any, any questions that you might have. Commissioner um, O'Brien? My question is more, um, you've made comments about how the configuration and maybe the high top table versus regular tables or booths may have contributed to this. I'm assuming, but just want to make sure that's been conveyed um, to Big Net Entertainment in terms of coming back to IEB in 2021, potentially to reopen, to make sure those concerns are part of what's addressed. Um, I mean, it's conveyed publicly now, and we will certainly be having uh, follow-up uh, conversations with them about their, about their plans, absolutely. C Commissioner, I mean, um, Loretta, though, in terms of that, um, they, the, the arrangement that they had was in compliance with the state guidelines. It, it's just, I think, in this case, would you say the fact that many of these individuals knew each other, so the interaction maybe provided by a high top, the ease of getting out from a high top stool was uh, because they knew each other. Uh, we hadn't had any reports on that activity happening prior to, to that night, correct? Th that's right. And that may be a factor that attendance was higher uh, on that night and that the folks there did know one another as opposed to, you know, separate parties uh, coming in. Um, I do have some question about that narrow um, area between the two bars. 
you know, it, it appears that the tables themselves, edge to edge, may be six feet apart, but, you know, when you have the chairs and the way the chairs are utilized at the bars, you know, you have a less than ideal uh, situation there, um, you know, regardless. So I think we'd want to take a closer look at, at that. Thank, thanks for the clarification. It was a follow-up question for uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Commissioner O'Brien, did you have another question? Or comment? No, but other than um, to say that given given your comment again, that this may be technically in compliance, the fact that the reality on the ground is leading to some concerns, yeah. you know, it, it may be as the spring unfolds and we have, you know, not normal, but getting close, you have more attendance and I'd like to see it fixed, flow wise, structure wise, et cetera, so that we're eliminating what we've seen as a potential problem. Absolutely. Thank you. This follow-up question as well. Um, mm -hmm. it, it sounds like um, the staff in this particular restaurant is not as vigilant as the staff in the casino with regard to encouraging or, or mandating the, the masks worn properly and the distancing. So it would, would seem to me that additional training to that staff may be in order before they reopen as well so that they understand that they need to be really vigilant um, with with those compliance measures? You know, that's that's a good point, Commissioner, because we have felt that on the casino floor that employees at all levels, it's been a top to bottom approach and that employees at all levels uh, have been made to feel empowered to, um, you know, do their part to see that these measures are enforced. So, you know, that that is a good point um, about the about the restaurant employees as well. Commissioner Zunica, Commissioner Stebbins. Okay, he's all set. Commissioner Stebbins, you are you all set? Oh, you know, just to say, I appreciate GEU and the IEB's work on this. Um, you know, certainly Commissioner Cameron makes a good recommendation about making sure that that operator staff are, are, are brought up to speed with what they should feel free to be able to do in talking with patrons. Um, you know, overall, it's just disappointing the behavior of these um, patrons has, you know, led to this decision to, to shut down the restaurant in 2021 and affect the livelihood of all their employees. And, you know, that's, that's disappointing. But um, I, I have to compliment them on seeing that the event was getting out of hand and that they tried to take appropriate actions and do it quickly to, to close the restaurant and move everybody out. Can I also okay. just a point sure. of clarification though, um, Loretta, excuse me. Um, you know, again, I think I heard you clearly, but I just wanna reiterate that this decision to close, one, I do applaud them for recognizing and, and closing early, uh, to Commissioner Stebbins' point, but they've also decided to close altogether. And as Commissioner Stebbins points out, that does mean it affects the, the livelihood of those who were working there. Um, but it was their decision to, to take that step. Um, at this point in time, you might have had corrective actions in mind, but you um, had not in any way delivered a message uh, to this vendor that uh, closure was um, going to be required or recommended. Oh, absolutely not. The, the decision was theirs. We were really still in a, you know, fact finding um, uh, mode uh, when they informed us about this. Um, all, it, it came, the formal um, notification came on Monday, uh, but I think they had notified um, uh, GEU and Bruce even earlier than Monday that they were thinking about that. Uh, so, they, they did that on their own and you know I, I understand they are a, a, a group that is um, uh, you know a prominent group in this region and uh, you know I'm, I'm sure they uh, you know were, as I said approached the whole thing very responsibly um, and uh, you know this was a decision that, that they came to on their own uh, we didn't request and we we never talked uh, to them about uh, measures or signaled uh, that there would be um, 
know, any kind of mandated closing at all. Anything further? Extensive report, excellent, thorough investigations, and again, with all the right um, uh, considerations in, in mind at this very challenging time. So. so, yes, thank you, Chair. And, you know, again, we uh, in the IEB know that we're still in a very critical period uh, in this pandemic. Uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel, but uh, not a time to let our guard down uh, now. So thank you. That's so well put, Loretta. Thank you. All right. Um, then I believe, um, Director Wells, am I right that we are, can move on to item number four, or do you have anything to close with? That is correct. Go ahead with uh, item number four, Madam Chair. Okay, well, we are shifting gears um, to some historic import. Um, it's hard to believe it's historic because it wasn't that long ago, correct? But we um, will now hear from uh, Director Mark Vanderlinden, Research and Res um, Responsible Gaming on Encore's construction report. I've been looking forward to this, Mark. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, I too have been really looking forward to, to this. Um, I'm joined uh, by Dr. Rachel Volberg, who is the principal investigator on this project, as well as uh, Rod Matamady, who is a senior research manager at the UMass Donahue Institute. Um, before I turn it over to them, I just wanted to say a few words. Uh, the Expanded Gaming Act directs the MGC to develop an annual research agenda in order to understand the social and economic effects of casino gambling in the Commonwealth. The Commission selected the UMass Amherst School of Public Health and Health Sciences and the UMass Donahue Institute to carry out key aspects of this research agenda. Together, they form the SIGMA project, or the Social and Economic Impacts of Gaming in Massachusetts. Since 2013, our partnership with these two highly respected institutions has produced over 40 reports and publications and provided residents of Massachusetts with a first of its kind gambling oversight system that provides neutral information on decision making, early warning signs of changes connected to gambling in the Commonwealth, and information to inform the services to prevent and mitigate gambling related harm. The present report on the construction of Encore Boston Harbor adds to this body of research and, and contributes greatly to our understanding of the economic impacts of the casino industry in Massachusetts. The study that you're about to hear about provides detail to the $1.6 billion of direct costs associated with building the casino. It measures the economic ripple effect across the state and reports on key aspects of the construction workforce. So why is it important? Uh, the Expanded Gaming Act was passed in large part to stimulate job growth and benefit the local and state economy. Uh, Rod Matamity will provide in detail and describe the success of this project in accomplishing those two goals. Um, I will turn it over to him in just a second. Uh, before I do so, I wanted to just do a, a call out to uh, the individuals that um, without their participation and collaboration, this simply would not be possible, including uh, Suffolk Construction, who provided um, a, an enormous amount of collaboration in providing the data to our research team. Our research review committee, who uh, we always have at least a couple of rounds of, of feedback on the report before we're satisfied that it is final. Um, and not least of which is Encore Boston Harbor, um, and specifically Jackie Crum, who is, who is joining us uh, today. Um, their collaboration on making sure that the data is, is um, complete and accurate is really important. Um, and actually following uh, Rod's presentation, um, I hope Jackie will, will also say a few words just about the, uh, the construction. Um, her perspective on this is is uh, is pretty in depth. So, uh, with that, I will turn it over to you, uh, Rachel and Rod. You can, if you want to, unmute yourself. Yep. Uh, can everyone hear me? Great. Yes. Great. 
Madam Chair, uh, Commissioners, I, I hope you'll indulge me for just a couple of minutes um, to say farewell to Bruce Devins. Um, I first met Bruce uh, in 2012 uh, when our UMass-based uh, Amherst-based uh, team began exploring the possibility of uh, competing for this project that we uh, were successful in uh, getting and began in 2013. Um, but I, I think uh, the real way that, that Bruce um, managed to get into my mind this morning was that in every subsequent meeting where we presented after that first meeting in 2012, Bruce never failed to remind me how thoroughly we terrified him with our knowledge of Section 71 of the Expanded Gaming Act. <laughs> so, Bruce, it's, it's been such a pleasure working with you. Um, and uh, I hope you'll come back to Western Massachusetts and visit us frequently. Um, and uh, I, know that, um, the, I know that the Cannabis Control Commission um, is uh, looking forward to you, uh, not least of whom is probably Julie Johnson, uh, who is their director of research. Thank you, thank you, Rachel. I, I, I wanna add, I think Commissioner Zuniga might have been equally afraid of Section 71 as I was, but um, it's, it's been a pleasure working with you and your entire team. It's, uh, it's been an incredible opportunity, so thank you. Thank you. So the presentation we have today uh, focuses on the economic impacts of the construction of Encore Boston Harbor. Um, and as Mark has already indicated, Section 71 of the Expanded Gaming Act uh, ensured that these impacts of the construction of the new casinos in Massachusetts could be identified. And I just want to emphasize um, the, the uniqueness of that particular section of the Expanded Gaming Act, which um, is, is truly a unique and one of a kind uh, in the United States. So the report that you'll be hearing today is the final one of three that our economic team from the UMass Donahue Institute has completed to help understand the spending, employment, and economic impacts of the construction phase of the casino industry in Massachusetts. Going forward, we will be turning our focus to fully understanding the operational impacts of the casino industry in the Commonwealth as well as assessing the impacts of COVID-19 on the casino industry. So I just wanted to make just a few brief remarks and I'm going to turn it now over to Rod Motamity who will be presenting the report this morning. Rod? Good morning, everyone. I'm going to do the screen share now. Good morning. Um, so let's see here. Okay, can everyone see the slide correctly? I have yeah. two monitors, so I'm never quite sure what screen you're seeing, so. We're seeing the slides. Okay, not the notes. Not the notes. <laughs> right, all right. Um, so, thank you everyone. Um, I'd like to thank again, um, the Commission and uh, Director Van Der Linden for inviting us to present today. Uh, as you've heard, over the past many years, uh, the people of Massachusetts have heard much about the potential uh, harms and benefits of expanding gaming and the wisdom of doing so. We on the Sigma team are honored to have been able to study so many aspects of this project over these years, um, some of which more controversial than others, but I think today is perhaps one of the least controversial aspects of the game expansion, which is the construction. I think it, it's clear that spending hundred, hundreds of millions, or in this case, a couple billion dollars to build something new will undoubtedly create income and employment for many. That was known you know, prior to the fact. Uh, our objective with this study is to put a finer point on where and to whom these benefits accrue. So before I really get into the results of the study, there are a few details that I want First is to clarify what exactly it is that we've studied. Um, we didn't evaluate the full investment, the $2.1 billion, but rather the $1.6 billion of that, uh, which is construction. 
total investment includes things like the casino's license application fees, um, the land purchases, pre-opening expenses, and perhaps most notably uh, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, um, which are basically the things that one would see filling the space, the gaming machines, the tables, TVs, couches, beds and bedding, pots and pans, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we didn't include those things because typically they are purchased uh, on contract from out-of-state vendors uh, and thus don't typically create direct impacts in Massachusetts. Um, however, uh, insofar as local businesses uh, will clean, maintain, repair, or replenish any of those supplies, uh, we'll capture that in our operations reports that are forthcoming. The next two points are uh, kind of housekeeping. Um, Director van der Linden already mentioned uh, the fact that uh, Suffolk Construction Company was our data provider. Um, as their role as the construction manager for the project, uh, they oversaw all the contractors and subcontractors and payments and so forth. So uh, we worked with them, obviously with the uh, guidance and encouragement of uh, Jackie and her colleagues at Encore. I would like to take a moment in my admittedly limited time to single out uh, Emily Earle at Suffolk, uh, who helps me with data collection there. Uh, she was my main contact. She was nothing but helpful through both the birth of her first child and all the COVID disruptions. So, um, you know, with all of the power of Section 71, with all of the um, regulatory authority of the MGC to compel action on behalf of the um, licensees, at the end of the day, the success of the Stigma Project comes down to individuals making a choice to stand up and be helpful. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I want to acknowledge Emily um, and others for, for making that choice and being helpful to us. And lastly, uh, just to, like, again, another housekeeping point, our data was current at the time of data delivery. As a result, it's a snapshot in time. Um, the data came to us after the conclusion of the construction project, so we don't expect any major changes. Um, but even with MGM, we saw that uh, there were some small modifications as things were audited and so on after the data came to us. In that case, it was low single digit percentages, and so they made no material impact on our findings, and we don't expect there to be uh, any difference uh, in this case. So uh, I shall not bury the lead any more than I already have. Um, here are the things that I believe are the key findings of our expand on each of these points as I go through my presentation, but I want to highlight them here so we can kind of in mind as we go through this. The first is that most of the construction spending stayed in Massachusetts. And most of the spending in Massachusetts uh, went to companies in the Metro Boston area. The area was also home to most of the construction workers. Next, 13% of the contracts by value went to companies that met at least one of the diversity criteria of being a, either a woman, minority, or veteran-owned business enterprise. Um, and the data suggests that the construction workforce that was used was representative of the state's construction workforce in terms of race, gender, and veteran status. And lastly, after accounting for the ripple effects that Director van der Linden alluded to, um, of economic impacts as they move around through the economy and leakages out of the economy through imports, commuting, and so on, we found that the $1.6 billion of construction spending created $2.6 billion of total economic activity uh, and the related uh, income and jobs that would be needed to produce that economic activity. So as I said, we'll go through all of this in a bit more detail, but I think that's where the key findings are. A key driver of the geographic distribution of the contracts and the workers, and thus as a result, the impacts of uh, the economic impacts is just the location of Encore Boston Harbor. So located where it is uh, off of Route 99 in Everett, uh, right across the river from what seems to me the ever expanding assembly row area of Somerville, um, one would expect that given where it's located, um, the economic impacts would be proximate to the, the construction site. And we saw that with the construction study of uh, Clambridge Park Casino and MGM Springfield, where the economic benefits grow 
uh, with proximity to the construction site. So this map further illustrates the distribution of contracts around the state. Uh, note that businesses in five counties uh, didn't receive uh, any contracts, uh, Franklin County, Berkshire County, and the three counties of the Cape and Islands. Um, so of the $1.6 billion in construction spending, $1.1 billion stayed in Massachusetts. That, that's a pretty good uh, size portion of that. Of the total 1.6, 27% went to Suffolk County, 15% to Middlesex, and then Norfolk and Plymouth, excuse me, Plymouth uh, make up most of the rest. At a smaller, more disaggregated level, 28% of all Massachusetts-based spending went to the host and surrounding communities. So that's roughly 440 some odd million. Almost 90% of that amount went to Boston, went to businesses in Boston, but that isn't as out of whack perhaps as it would originally seem. A lot of that is due to the fact that Suffolk Construction Company is located in Boston. And as the prime contractor and construction manager for a $1.6 billion construction project, one would imagine that a lot of money would cycle through there. So, if you remove the effects of Suffolk, it's really more like a hundred something million dollars went to uh, Boston. Uh, and after that, Everett was the next highest with $32 million. So, so roughly 75% of the construction spending was awarded to companies in Massachusetts, but the remaining quarter did go out of state. The vast majority of the money that left Massachusetts remained within the United States only 4% of the total construction spending went to foreign imports. Over 4% for projects of the size, this is like $70 million. Um, there was 36 other states in addition to Massachusetts that received um, some, uh, some uh, construction spending, some contracts, though it's proportionally pretty small. Uh, Rhode Island was the next highest state after Massachusetts, though it only had roughly $96 million worth of contracts, which is only 4% of what Massachusetts received. Beyond that, Connecticut and New York are the only other states that received over $50 million worth of contracts. So you take the top four, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, that's 85% of contract value uh, is just in those, uh, those four neighboring uh, nearby states. So again, the rest of those you know, states that you see there while there are contracts there, they are proportionally rather small uh, to the size of the country. We also looked at uh, the destination of the spending, uh, the, the companies uh, by um, their diversity or location criteria. Again, this is of the ownership. We'll, we'll get to the workers in a little bit. Um, what we found was that 20% roughly or $355 million of contracts by value went to companies that met the local criteria. And together 13% went to companies that met at least one of the diversity criteria. That's a $208 million in total. Um, for those of you who are interested in doing some quick arithmetic, every 1% is $60 million. So um, that's 1%. Uh, to the VBE, so that's $60 million, 2% is $32 million, uh, and so on. But it's 13% uh, 13 uh, 13 total, $208 million for the companies that, again, that met at least one of the diversity criteria. And um, my recollection is that this is um, pretty in line with and perhaps better than um, Encore's as stated goals. So now taking a shift to talk about the workers. We talked about some of the stuff on the business side. Now we're gonna take a look at the worker side. What we, uh, what we estimated from our calculations is that roughly 6,700 individuals uh, likely cycled through the site at some point over the construction project. Again, it could have been for an hour, it could have been for months, but at some point cycled through the site. Um, and they, these individuals, sorry, was someone? And I just want to make sure that you, we hear you clearly when you lean into the microphone and it just occasionally oh, okay. lean away. I'm so. using a headset. I think it's moving around. Let me try that. Oh, Is that but better? we are hearing almost like 99% of what you're saying, but every word matters. So thank you. Sure. Let me see if I can fix this microphone. I'm going to use the mock turtle collar here to see if I can uh, manage. 
nailed down the microphone a bit better. Is this better? Okay. Um, where was I? Um, oh yeah, 5.2 million hours. So we think that, so the data suggests that that's about uh, the total number of hours worked, which is considerable. Um, due to the nature of construction, we didn't expect the average hours worked per worker to be super high. Uh, the way the trades work is you cycle on and off the site as needs dictate, right? The electricians don't come on until there's a building envelope for them to work in. The plumbers don't come on or the finished carpenters don't come on until they're needed and they cycle off when they're finished. Average hours worked uh, was about 760 hours per worker, which is 19 40 hour weeks. So just under five months that was about the average. If you take those hours and you convert them to full-time equivalents, so you divide them by 2,080 hours, uh, that works out to 2,500 uh, FTE. That's um, about what we got. Total compensation for workers on this project was just under $250 million. I'd like to note that compensation differs from wages in that it includes the value of benefits. Uh, the average worker received about $36,500 in compensation on this project for an average hourly rate of $47.89. To give you some context, um, the national average compensation rate for a construction worker is $35.83, so about $12 less. However, we know that Massachusetts living costs are higher and thus wages tend to be a bit higher. So I searched for uh, state level average compensation by industry. That data isn't readily available, but I was able to find average wage data by industry, uh, which suggests that Massachusetts construction workers earn a 30% higher wage than the national average. So if you scale up national comp by 30%, you get $46.58, which is a couple of dollars lower than what we see here. So this isn't an exact outcome, but at the very least, it suggests that these workers were paid, again, at the very least in line with state norms, if not a little bit, if not a little bit more. Um, we found that workers residing in Everett and the surrounding communities earned slightly lower average hourly compensation rates uh, than the average for all workers. This finding aligns with what we saw uh, for the host communities as well in MGM Springfield and the PPC construction projects. Uh, and given how different these places are, um, from each other, the labor sheds, their local economies, and so forth. We think the most likely explanation for this uh, co compensation rate observation is that the labor for the most common trades, things like iron workers, electricians, pipe fitters, etc., can be found locally. While the only reason you would bring a worker from farther away was because they possess specialized knowledge or skills that couldn't be procured locally, and thus those folks would justify higher pay. So because we saw this same kind of ringed uh, outcome in both the, you know, in Plainville and Springfield and Everett, um, we don't think it's a community specific thing. We think it's more of a structure of where you would source workers from for these projects. And again, the most you know, common uh, trades and skills you can find locally and you have to look further afield for more specialized trades and thus pay people more. So within the Commonwealth, as we mentioned early in the presentation, half of the workers uh, reside in either Middlesex or Suffolk counties. After those two counties, um, you see the workers are spread relatively evenly across eastern Massachusetts, and then they drop off pretty quickly as you gain more distance from everything. Again, this sort of logic makes sense. Of the roughly 3,300 workers uh, who reside in Middlesex and Suffolk counties, um, most live in the host and surrounding communities. So 62% of those, or roughly 2,000, lived in the host and surrounding communities. Um, or roughly 327 workers, our estimates suggest, uh, resided in Everett itself. So I want to talk a little bit about the race and ethnicity of the construction workers used on the Encore Boston Harbor project versus uh, their Sort of comparison groups. And I want to take a little extra minute to walk through this because the findings here are a little bit more nuanced than they are elsewhere in the report. Uh, 
Um, and this, it kind of boils down to the data we had and the data we didn't have. So there are some things we can say with high confidence, and that is taken as a whole, the workers used for the Encore Boston Harbor construction project are representative of construction workers as a whole in Massachusetts in terms of uh, gender, race, and ethnicity, as I said in the beginning. So for, uh, sorry, and veteran status. So for uh, gender and veteran status, it's right on the money. 7% of Massachusetts construction workers are women, and 7% of all hours on this project were done by women. 7% of construction, or sorry, 6% are veterans, and 6% on this project were veterans. The data actually suggests that the construction workers on this project were actually more diverse than construction workers as a whole for the state. We found that um, the workers on this project were 61% white, whereas 75% of workers in construction occupations for the state are white, so um, a, a more diverse uh, group. Where we have low confidence in our findings um, is comparing the workers on the project who are from Everett to people from Everett who are in construction occupations generally. Um, and that's where the, the data limitations uh, really um, came into play. So the publicly available data for occupation by race, by town, has very high margins of error, somewhere in the vicinity of 20 to 25%. And so with margins that big, it's hard to make any claim definitively uh, because at the lower end or the upper end of those error bounds, you could get wildly different sort of conclusions. If you take the census data at its face, it says that 60% of people who live in, live in Everett who are in a construction occupation are white. The, uh, data for this project shows that 54% of the workers were white. So again, if you take the census data at its face value, the workers on this project were actually more diverse than their peer cohort. However, I have provided the Ever Everett working age population uh, as just a context, right? We don't expect the working age population to be representative of the mix in any particular, any particular occupation. But what we see here is that uh, Everett is a white minority city. Um, and at the very least, the data suggests that the construction occupations are not uh, representative, at least in terms of race and ethnicity, of the population as a whole. Um, of the, so the, the, the occupation as a whole, construction occupations as a whole, is not representative of the city as a whole. Um, so there is some work to do there on, on those occupations. Um, and again, as best we can tell, the, um, the data seem to suggest that the workers from Everett were at least representative of those in construction occupations, but it's inconclusive. I do want to point out to switch back to our um, high confidence things about the broad representat representativeness of the group. Of a project this size, you might think 7% uh, female participation, 6% veteran participation, um, you know, 39% minority participation. Those sound low, um, though they are representative. But then again, of a project this size, we're talking 391,000 hours of work for women, almost 298,000 hours of work for veterans, and almost 1.4 million hours of work for minorities. So. When a project has 5.2 million hours of work, six or seven percent is a lot of work. Um, so it is worth um, applauding at least those um, opportunities. And one last thing I would point out on this topic before we switch gears is uh, to the commissioners. Um, in your evaluation of this report, um, when you get to this section, if you feel that it requires more context or explanation, please let us know and, and, and we can. So switching gears now to the economic impact analysis. We talked about the, how money flowed to businesses, um, how workers were hired and where they were, uh, and now we're gonna switch gears and figure out how that all ripples out through the economy. Um, we've said to you in these presentations before that we use a 
uh, a model from a company called Regional Economic Models Incorporated that's based in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, we think they make uh, a model that has a lot of advantages for us for this project. We have divided it up into the six regions you see here. Um, we chose these six regions for two reasons. One is that they aggregate up to the, the three gaming regions, which obviously is useful. And two, they represent existing commuting and economic linkages in the state. So those are the regions that you're going to see results for in this presentation and in the accompanying report. So uh, here you see the um, employment impacts. So after our doing our economic modeling, we found that uh, statewide, the construction of Encore Boston Harbor created or supported an average of 2,500 jobs per year, which peaked at roughly 3,350 jobs in 2017. Interestingly, that was also the peak year of construction employment impacts for the MGM Springfield construction project as well. So clearly that was a, a good year to be a construction worker um, in Massachusetts. Um, I think we've talked about what direct, indirect, and induced mean before, but by way of uh, refresher, uh, direct is uh, the things that are quite literally directly uh, attached or attributable to the project. So these are the construction workers themselves. Indirect is the business to business chain, the vendor to vendor. The construction project buys some concrete. The concrete vendor then needs to buy some cement and some trucks. The truck vendor then needs to buy some steel, et cetera. That's the indirect chain. The induced chain is largely consumption, but it also includes investment in government spending. But it's mostly, I am now employed. I have a paycheck. I go buy. Um, child, care, child care services or restaurant meal, those businesses then pay their own employees who then make their own purchases and so forth. Um, what you'll see, I think, of note here is that the indirect jobs are proportionally pretty small compared to the others. And the reason for that is in a construction project in a state like Massachusetts, the supply chain very quickly leaves the state. Um, we don't make cement, we don't make rebar, we don't make wires, we don't make, um, you know, windows and doors, we don't, you know, and so all of that stuff that you need for a construction project is largely going to be imported. And so that indirect business-to-business uh, -business supply chain very quickly exits the state and thus the, the impacts disappear from Massachusetts. Of the total jobs, roughly two-thirds were in construction. Um, and then the next four in the top five are healthcare and social assistance, retail trade, state and local government, and accommodation and food services. So basically the next four are essentially things that are supported by consumption. More people have jobs, the paychecks get spent, and it goes to largely consumption-based goods with the exception of state and local government, which just tends to fluctuate with general economic activity. Next, we're gonna talk about the, the dollar impacts. So here we have total economic activity, otherwise known as output or uh, revenues or business sales, you know, you know, AKA a lot of things. Uh, and then we have net new economic activity, also known as value added or gross product. This is a term that most people are familiar with. Um, I'll get into the next slide about how these things differ from each other, but purposes of this one, I just wanted to reiterate a couple things. Here again, we can see the ramifications of the geographical distribution of contracts and workers. Because those things are, are concentrated in Metro Boston due to the location of the casino, the impacts tend to be concentrated there as well. Metro Boston is further aided by the fact that it's the economic hub of the state. So transactions or economic activity that happens anywhere a small piece of that might cycle through Metro Boston anyway. So it's sort of further aided in that, in that way. The annual average column will give you a, a good sense of what to expect or, or what the impacts were in a typical year. Whereas the cumulative column shows the economic activity over the five year analysis period. So in my last slide, I just wanna walk the audience through what is total economic activity? What is net new economic activity? How do we give them one to the other? So, so I'm 
just going to walk through this from left to right. So we start with $1.6 billion of construction. Right off the bat, we lose half a billion because that leaves the state to buy things from elsewhere. So we start with $1.1 billion of in-state construction. Through those direct and indirect effects that we just talked about, through supply chains, through consumer effects and so forth, um, we get an additional roughly $1.5 billion of economic activity. We wind up at $2.6 billion. However, in order to produce that $2.6 billion, we need to use up other things. Nothing is made from nothing. So for example, to make a car, you use up steel, you use up plastic, you use up wiring, you use up legal services, you use up marketing services. It's not accurate to say, what is the total value of things that this economy created if you count both the car and the steel? Because you, the, the car is sold at such a price that it includes the value of everything that went into it. So in that same logic, to say, oh, we're gonna count all of the things that were used up in producing all this economic activity, and count all the new economic activity, we're essentially counting things twice. So what, to get from total to net, we subtract the things that were consumed in production. So that's roughly a billion dollars worth of things. And that's how we get to $1.6 billion of net new economic activity, or $1.6 billion of gross state product or value added, or whichever term you're more familiar with, they're all the same. And, so that's it. Um, as a final point, I'd just like to draw the audience's attention to the bottom link on this slide. Uh, there you'll be able to find the report accompanying this presentation shortly after this meeting ends. And you'll also be able to find any other reports that the city has produced. Uh, and after, uh, beyond that, I'm happy to stay on for questions. <clears throat> would, would you mind um, pulling your PowerPoint down so that we can restore our ability to see each other's faces. Please, thank you. So that's um, very comprehensive and exciting. Um, where do we begin, commissioners, with uh, questions, observations? It's, it's very exciting. Commissioner Zuniga. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, Ron and Rachel, for the, for the great overview. I have two, um, two perhaps comments, uh, one question and a comment. Um, I know this was not part of the analysis, uh, Rod, uh, but there was uh, uh, close to another billion dollars in, in costs that uh, was part of the initial investment, some of which was for regulatory costs that supports, frankly, some of our jobs and, and uh, the licensing fee goes to the state coffers that also supports a number of things. Um, would it be fair, and I know this is not part of this analysis uh, necessarily, but would it be fair to say that some of it might mirror some of the same uh, trends that you outline relative to the direct costs in terms of uh, induced as well as where they went, um, meaning that the, you know, um, the, the locality? Sure, um, I can uh, provide a little bit of context for that. Um, I'll, I'll start with one thing you actually didn't ask me about, and that's land acquisition costs. Um, we exclude those from economic impact analyses essentially as a, as a practice because a transfer of an asset is not an economic impact, right? So if I buy a stock share from you, all I've done is just moved a thing back and forth. That doesn't induce new economic activity. And land acquisition, we treat the same way for economic impact models. So that being excluded, um, the rest of it, yeah, in fact, especially things that went to regulatory costs and so forth, uh, government services tend to be labor. It tends to be the acquisition of labor and the provision of services that are provided by individuals. So the employment return on um, money that goes to uh, fund government services uh, tends to be very high. Um, so you would see a, a pretty significant um, employment return on those, um, those 
things, which is actually what we saw in the uh, operating impact study we did for Plain Ridge Park Casino. We actually found that the, the, sh the share of their tax revenue that goes to local aid and thus into local government spending actually creates larger economic impacts than the casino's own contained economic activity. Um, so that is a, a reaction that we would see there. Uh, in terms of the other procurements, um, yes, it would create these same economic uh, induced and indirect effects, but just likely in other states. Um, so where are those, uh, so Nevada, for example, that manufactures most of the gaming devices in the country, there's going to be a lot of indirect and induced activity generated there by buying, you know, thousands of slot machines uh, and so forth. But uh, a lot of those tend to leave the state because we just don't manufacture these things here. Was that about what you were going for, Commissioner Zinger? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, that's, that's a great context uh, and, and a good reminder about the land acquisition costs. Um, then the other thing that I would just like to comment on um, uh, is something that struck me as you were going through the presentation, um, and that is that uh, the, on the finding about a uh, representative aspect of uh, the population in terms of minority women and veteran status, that is in line with um, with what the, you know the state has. Um, but I would just note, and I think it should be noted, that that came through a lot of hard work. Um, it was, uh, it didn't happen by chance. There was a lot of efforts by many here, but were also, uh, you know, Jill and, and Commissioner Stebbins and many others, as well as um, a lot of stakeholders in this Access and Opportunity Committee uh, to try to always ensure that those, um, those results uh, endured. So thank you for, for noting it, I just wanted to emphasize uh, the work that it took. And not, not the least of which, uh, also uh, the licensee, Suffolk and, and everybody at Ancor, um, it, it just took a lot of you know, hard work. Commissioner Cameron? Yes, thank you. I had a follow-up question to uh, Commissioner Zuniga's question. Uh, I intended to, to ask about the 7%, 7%, in particular with women. Because again, we know how hard the uh, build the light that work campaign. I mean, all of that was um, it was as uh, Commissioner just pointed out, such hard work and such a such an accomplishment. But then the number, the overall state number, which is seven percent, was that after that campaign? So those numbers were in fact higher as well. It's not just the numbers on this particular project. Uh the numbers, I think, are a five-year average okay. uh, ending in, I want to say, 2018, maybe? So I think it, it, it would perhaps catch some of the, mm. those efforts, um, but not all of them. Okay, so I guess I was surprised that the numbers were the same, 7%. For this particular project and seven percent statewide unless there are other parts of the state that happen to have a higher percentage of women working i'm just that we're not aware of or we've never been i think part of it is also um a definitional thing that's sort of unavoidable on our part um the construction occupations is a lot of stuff right it's not necessarily women in the trades i see you know, so um, women in the trades could very well be much lower, but we don't have access to data that says, you know, how many female bricklayers are there? How many female masons are there? You know, um, so construction occupations could be supervisors, it could be some equipment operators, it could be um, a, a many of other things. So um, I do want to separate those two things because I think what uh, we might actually be talking about slightly different things. I think these efforts that have bore a lot of success was more about, you know, women in trades more broadly uh, than women in construction occupations, which is the best comparison that we could get data for. Okay, thank you for that. Before we continue, I do want to invite um, Jackie Crum, uh, Vice President General Counsel of Encore, to speak. Uh, I know that you partnered very closely with uh, Director Griffin and her team and Suffolk uh, to achieve so much of these accomplishments that we've heard in detail today. So um, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
So I was just reflecting that seven years ago today, I was frantically working to complete the RFA2 application. <laughs> and I was laughing when I was hearing this presentation because at the time, the RFA, our project was 1.6 billion all in. <laughs> As we all know, that didn't work out so well for us. But anyway, <laughs> um, a large part of that application was obviously focused on the impacts of uh, construction. And Commissioner Stebbins, if I recall correctly, you were uh, responsible for the economic development section. And um, I believe you gave us three out of four in the overall well done categories. <laughs> so we appreciate that. Um, we have very strong opinions on the matter, uh, but understood that research and facts were needed to uh, back up those opinions. To that end, we engaged uh, two separate consultants to analyze data and to provide us projections. And it very quickly became apparent to us that while there are lots of studies on discrete aspects of casino construction projects, there was no comprehensive study that the legislature and the commission had the foresight to commission a study of this breadth is a huge benefit for the industry now. We now have a roadmap for future projects and something to back up our opinions. Um, I'd also like to thank our construction partner, Suffolk Construction, and our con construction team led by Peter Campo, for staying on top of this on a daily basis, working with Jill, working with the commission. It really was an all hands on board uh, achievement. And last but not least, I'd like to thank the Sigma team, Rod and Rachel, I know it was an extraordinary effort to put this, uh, put to distill all this information, and it was a vast amount of data into such a comprehensive and digestible report. So thank you for that. And if I may, may I say something very brief to Commissioner Stebbins? You may, and you don't even have to be so brief. Thank you. So first of all, congratulations, Commissioner Stebbins. Um, I can't believe it's been over seven years. Uh, we will certainly miss your thoughtful deliberation uh, always probing us to do better and your consistent support over all this time. Uh, but I do have a question for you. Does this mean that you're finally able to come to Uncle Boston Harbor and enjoy our facilities? Uh, Commissioner Zuniga is shaking his head yes. Um, I, I'll, I'll, you, look for, I'll look for legal counsel to give me I'm a full opinion. I'm looking at counselor. You wish to chime in? You can go. We just can't take free stuff. <laughs> New free stuff. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, congratulations. We couldn't, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you. And I speak on behalf of our entire team. Um, it's, it's been a wonderful experience. You've had, uh, you've touched every part of our project. And uh, we couldn't have been more appreciative of your support. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jackie. It, it goes without saying, I've been humbled and privileged to have had the opportunity to work with you and Jenny and Bob and so many others uh, over at Encore Boston Harbor and uh, uh, I, I remain amazed at what you were able to do with a property that had been long forgotten and ignored and uh, and, and kind of left to its own devices so thank you for you know the the dramatic impact you've had on, on the city at Everett and the immediate surrounding area. Um, Madam Chair I got a, a couple of just quick questions for for uh, for Rod if I can. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, uh, Rod, first of all, thanks to you and your team. Um, the, the breakdown of what the impact meant county by county, I think, was uh, uh, extensive data and, and hopefully reassures the residents of those counties that uh, you know, the introduction of gaming was a good thing that had many positive impacts. Um, and also to, to thank Emily and, and the team at Suffolk for helping you out. Um, as well as our own team. And, and just to reiterate what Commissioner Zuniga said, the great work by uh, Jill Griffin, the Access and Opportunity Committee that she pulled together and the great input that we had from our licensees in that process, what process was extensive. Um, just a, a quick question. Some of the money that, you know, 4% of the project costs, uh, though not extensive, was uh, apparently spent overseas. And I just, and you might be able to help me confirm this or Jackie, that some of those were really unique construction items that have given us the, the construction project that we have today, you know, curved escalators and some other, you know, really high end niche items that uh, just cannot be found or constructed 
uh, by companies here in the, in the United States. So just to give an explanation of where that kind of offshore uh, uh, money was spent would be, uh, I don't know whether you have that or uh, Jackie, you might want to have a chance to weigh in as well. Uh, I don't, I would have that knowledge in a spreadsheet, but not in my brain at the moment. So if Jackie okay. has, um, uh, you know, greater insight onto that, I'll uh, defer to her. So uh, you, you're correct. So some of that was just sort of the unique items, uh, the chandeliers, the uh, curved escalators, two sets of curved escalators. Yes. <laughs> one to replace the one that got flooded, but yes. Um, so it really was. Um, I think as part of our design process, what we what we did was we we try to obtain unique items to put in the in the property throughout the property. So some of the artwork uh, did come from overseas as well. That would make up a large portion of it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll just add to that that uh, unrelated to this project, in the case of PPC, um, we had uh, we found a lot of imports from Canada. And in that case, it was all structural steel that they needed um, for their building. I guess it was the easiest and closest place to obtain what they needed, uh, and we did that. So this is a different beast entirely. Okay, and I, I think I know the answer to this already, Rob. But I'm I'm assuming the extensive cleanup costs that were part of the the construction project were included in the overall numbers that you pulled together. That's my understanding. It, okay. That's a good point, and that was about um, how many million? 70, 70 million? Over 70 million. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was included, okay. Um, which is, of course, uh, just a significant uh, uh, environmental investment. <clears throat> Any other particular questions? I have a couple. One's pretty nuanced, Ron. It's um, methodology only because you pointed it out and I thought it was interesting that you were able to extrapolate the impact of Suffolk being a Boston located uh, company and the impact that had on the, your overall analysis. And I hadn't really given that any thought. Um, are you saying be, because of their headquarters are in Boston and the number of employees who are located there, they were included in the analysis, is that fair? Essentially, yes. So um, because we, we got the data um, at a, a contract level, so we, you know, this big company got X, um, we were able to align those with addresses, obviously, and then uh, put them in cities, towns, or counties as needed. Uh, and so we had a line item for Suffolk Construction Company with an address in Boston, and we knew what their receipts were as a part of this project. So we were able to allocate that money that they got as the pro project manager um, to that location. Um, but being able to also look at it at a company level uh, allowed us to make that differentiation of saying, you know, these big Boston impacts are due to the fact that the construction manager happens to be there. It's not that, you know, because people hear, well, all the, you know, sound dismissive, but, you know, that's a, a common, I live in Western Massachusetts, you know, we, which, Parenthetically, I'm really glad for Zoom because I didn't want to drive from this. <laughs> no um, kidding. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I live in Western Mass and the, the, the complaint here is that the state only thinks about the eastern half of the state, you know, all the stuff goes there. So I wanted to make a point of saying our data allows us to, to show that these big impacts in the city of Boston, a lot of that, if not most of that, is just coincidentally where the construction manager happens to be based. If, that, if Boston's office was in Burlington, then all that money would have been in Burlington, you know, or if it was in Quincy, it would have been in Quincy. So um, once you remove the Suffolk part, the, the contracts that went to Boston weren't so disproportional seeming uh, as, it, as it looked, which is the, the point that I was trying to make broadly. But then to your point um, that yes, that once we allocated that there, we were able to account for uh, some of the uh, employment and income impacts yeah. as a result. Yeah, otherwise it would have been disproportionate. Um, that's very, very helpful. And then just because of sort of my concrete thinking, um, you closed so well um, with your last slide. Could you just give us a couple of um, reminders of the, um, um, the goods and services used up where you had to do your takeaway? Um, that are specific to 
this project? Uh, so the, um, are you asking what kinds of goods and services would have been used up? Yeah, or just in what, this or what does that represent? Well, because of course you, you got to the, the 2.6 new activity, 2.6 million activity, and you quite rightly explained, but there is a cost of, of goods and services that are used up. And I think right. you did the, the car industry for our example. If you could give one that's, you know, for my concrete thinking, uh, just a good example for um, this project, that would be really helpful. Okay. Got it. So suppose um, I wanted to sell you a building. Um, so, which is basically what we're talking about here, right? Someone is buying a building. Um, the price that I charge you for the building would include the cost of everything I had to buy to make the building uh, that is now there, um, plus everything I had to pay my workers, everything I had to pay for equipment, then profit and taxes and et cetera, et cetera. So that stuff that is left behind in the building, that would be a, an example of the goods and services that are used up. So I bought dimensional lumber to frame out the walls. I, so in the case of uh, economic activity, that transaction would show up twice. It would show up once that I bought it from the lumber mill. It would show up again when I sold you the building because the price of the building includes the price of the lumber. So in order to figure out what the net value is of that economy created, you have to remove that double counting. So you gotta remove the plumbing fixtures, you gotta remove the wood, the drywall, uh, and so on, and only capture that value once, which is in the value of the final building. Is that a bit clearer? That, that's very, very helpful. Um, it's such an important takeaway and, and explains how we went from that 2.6 down uh, to the, the 1.6, so thank you. Yeah, uh, the, you know, it's the, the overall message. Really helpful. Correct. I'm glad. Um, <clears throat> Commissioner Zuniga. Thank you. Um, you know, this conversation uh, took me back to uh, the, the time of the deliberation um, and what we were, as Jackie was remembering the, the time for submitting the application. Um, and. Um, one of the things that we discussed uh, at length that was a big plus for this for this project was the amount of public good that came from remediating a huge site that was contaminated had uh, almost no alternative use um, given the cost of remediation and gave access to the city of Everett access to the to the harbor um, that every other surrounding community um, enjoyed, but they didn't. Um, is there a way to, besides in those broad terms, is there a way to outline that or quantify that? And I, again, I, 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 know, I know it's not part of this analysis, Rod, but what from an economist, from an economist's perspective could you say about those other attributes? Sure. Um, actually, we're struggling struggling isn't the quite word. We are wrestling with this same question in a project we're doing for the Department of Conservation and Recreation uh, right now, um, where, we're, where we're looking at uh, Interesting. Some, of the, some of the impacts of, of sort of what, are, what is the return on conservation, right? Um, this is a similar kind of question. Um, so you have a couple of different ways you can look at it. Uh, some of them are more concrete than others. Um, some of the more concrete are, for example, looking at changes in adjacent or surrounding property values. So what was the same exact unimproved property worth before and after the cleanup? Um, and so those increases in values essentially puts a monetary number on how much people um, were, are, you know, are essentially willing to pay for, uh, for this improved attraction. Um, another way that uh, economists get at this is, is through a survey. Um, so river cleanups are often uh, done this way that people ask, so how much would you pay to contribute to, uh, you know, um, wage differentials or another? Um, that more has to do with regional amenity, not like a, a, a focused cleanup like this, but you can look at how much less is someone willing to take to do the exact same job in a sunny, beautiful beach town versus a cold and harsh, you know, Midwestern location, for example. Um, but for this specific thing, I think we could look at uh, the property values, I think would be the easiest. 
uh, and if there were any um, issues with contamination in surrounding areas, like if there were uh, associated healthcare costs. So um, in some places near some mines, for example, the dust happens to carry a lot of lead. So, you know, schools and cities and, and surrounding those kinds of mines have a health impact from there. I don't know what state this place was in, if there was worry about contamination of, of dirt or water runoff in the surrounding areas, but the health avoided healthcare costs and improved health outcomes would be another way. In addition to property values, I can at least attest um, when I used to drive to work, um, I would drive along um, part of the highway that goes along the river, and um, at least some businesses are sprouting up that were recreation oriented, particularly the kayak um, business, uh, where recreational use has um, been enhanced. That river is much busier with boaters, um, uh, including uh, crew and kayakers and people running along the river. And I, I can't imagine that it's not in, in, uh, attributed to that, um, mm -hmm. that cleanup. Uh, so stay tuned, maybe we can follow up. I thought that was a really interesting question, Commissioner Zuniga, what is the benefit of um, of enhanced conservation. Uh, Mark, I think we might have another project. <laughs> um, other questions or comments? It's fascinating. Mark, how would you like to close out this great report? And, and uh, to both Rachel and Rod, thank you so much. Uh, this is a, a very um, exciting way to sort of close a, a difficult year to reflect back on this project which um, you know came to fruition in June of, of 2019. So um, we haven't been able to have enough, um, be able to view enough voters getting to Encore uh, because of the shutdown and the, and the temporary suspensions and all of our own, you know, our remote work. So we're looking forward to seeing all the benefits once um, 21 lifts a little bit of these remote operations. Mark? Yes, so um, thank you, Rod and, and Rachel, for the report. I think this is, this is an important capstone on the construction phase of casinos in Massachusetts, at least for now, um, without knowing exactly where Region 3 is going. But my back of the envelope math says that it's, it's been over three projects, three, is it three and a half billion dollars or so of, of construction and, and you can't deny the economic um, impact of, of that amount of money in the state over what is actually a relatively short period of time. Um, and to be able to have a neutral voice that, that comes from the Sigma team and the UMass Donahue Institute specifically um, is important and we shouldn't let such um, uh, such an event go or story go untold. As, as Jackie said, that the casino industry um, may get, you may get small snippets of information, but not a comprehensive look at the totality of the economic impact of, of this um, to the state of Massachusetts. And quite honestly, um, and especially now when we're a country that really needs as much economic help as, as we possibly can. So um, thanks for the hard work on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, turning now, uh, before we continue, commissioners, would you like a brief break? I see a, a couple of nods. Positive. Okay, um, it is 12.16. Um, should we do uh, to 12.30 or um, give a five minute, five or 10? I was hoping for a lunch break because we have a, a but I may be the only one here. I think we have a couple of um, items later on that might merit some real discussion, no? I think that's fair, um, and I'm sorry, because I was thinking maybe we need a quick break and then a later lunch break, but really is at this time fair to, to think about eating. Commissioner um, 
So should we do a half an hour and 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 quarter, be fine of by one? Me. quarter of one? Perfect. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you. I don't know if we'll see Jackie again. Um, have a um, a lovely holiday period, Jackie, and thank you for uh, your work today. And 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 as always, it's so nice to see you. Thank you for having me, and happy holidays to all of you. Thank you. Happy holidays. We'll um, uh, mute ourselves out and return um, at quarter of one. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, um, we'll get started. And we have a, a really um, meaty uh, remaining portion of our um, meeting. So I think I'm just getting my notes up now um, that we're turning to uh, Dr. Lightbaum. You have uh, extensive business to take care of today. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, commissioners. So our uh, first item on the agenda is the uh, Suffolk Downs request for the premium free, free period. They've asked for October 10th through December 31st, 2020. And um, this does require a vote. It's part of the um, chapter 128C, the simulcast legislation, or simulcast law. Has everybody had a chance to um, become acquainted with the materials on that? Any questions for Dr. Lightbound? Standard procedure, Dr. Lightbound, correct on this one? Correct. That's what I thought. And you do, and you require, um, uh, you'd like a vote today. Just, is somebody yes, prepared please. to make a motion? I can do that, Madam Chair. I move that the commission approve Suffolk Downs request for a premium free period from October 10th, 2020 through and including December 31st of 2020. Second. Thank you. Um, any further questions? I just have a technical, technical question that is not necessarily uh, this, this positive, but uh, the request goes beyond the current um, uh, period for which they are allowed to simulcast pending renewal of the simulcasting law, correct? This is for 2020. This is for this this year that we're currently in. Oh, oh. You know, it's we're catching up um, where there wasn't new legislation um, addressing this issue. We thought that we should have it on record that for this year this was what the what it was going to be. Fair enough. And then, uh, depending on uh, if we get legis new legislation, new racing legislation next year that'll probably be addressed in that legislation. And if not, uh, we'll come back and, and ask uh, for premium free period for 2021 later okay. on. Okay, thank you. Good clarification. Any other um, edits, suggestions, amendments? All right, uh, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And um, I vote yes, Erica, five zero. Thank you. The next two items, item B and C, the simulcast import request and the account wagering provider request, both are normally taken up in a, during a live racing application. So for Plain Ridge, the commission approved theirs during their application uh, earlier this year in November, where uh, Suffolk, legislation has been changed and they're not uh, applying for live racing, we bring this up as a separate um, issue. So um, the first item, the simulcast import locations are uh, the simulcast locations that they would like to use for the coming year, 2021. And um, I recommend that we approve this and it does require a vote. Any questions for uh, Dr. Lightbound on that? Does that does that implicate uh, Commissioner Zuniga's earlier question on timing? I see Mr. Tuttle has joined us. Uh, no, that's just for obviously if at some point Suffolk is not allowed to simulcast anymore, they would cease lo simulcasting. But until such time in 2021, these would be the locations they would be using. We're comfortable with that. Okay. Do I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the simulcast import locations. Um, 
requested by Suffolk Downs and identified in the attachment to its November 20, 2020 letter. Thank you. Questions, edits? Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, five, zero, Erica, thank you so much. Dr. Lightbaum. The next item is item C, the account wagering provider request from Suffolk Downs. These providers have all been approved by the Gaming Commission before. Um, ExpressBet is being rebranded, so we've included that name as part of this approval. So uh, later on this year, um, when that gets complete, nobody will have questions about um, whether it's Express Bet or First Bet. Is that um, how you say it, First Bet? Uh, as you said, uh, Chip Tuttle's on the call, COO of Suffolk Downs. Um, uh, I'll defer to Chip. Y yes, that is how you say it. Um, Thank you. Uh, it, yes. Just so for those who don't know why I'm, I'm questioning that, it's the number one slash capital S capital T. So I wondered how Dr. Lightbound is going to say that out loud. Thank you. <laughs> First bet. Okay. So this, this does require a vote and my recommendation is to approve it. Any questions for Dr. Lightbound other than that name? Do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I'm happy to move that the commission approve the Suffolk Downs request for approval of Express Bet, uh, also known as First Bet, TVG, Twin Spires, Naira Bets, and FanDuel Racing as their account wagering providers. Second. Thank you. Any any further questions? Okay. <clears throat> Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stephens. Uh, aye. And I vote yes, Erica, five zero. Thank you. Commissioner, uh, Dr. Lightbound. The next request from Suffolk Downs is, is a new request. They're requesting to use MBET. They're a uh, web-based, um, mobile betting platform. I have today with me Chad Bork, our senior financial analyst, and Chip Tuttle, the COO of Suffolk Downs. And um, I'll give a very brief intro and then um, turn it over to Chad, and then he'll turn it over to Chip to discuss it and if you have questions. So um, briefly, the way it works is a patron would go to the teller at the racetrack and ask to set up an MBET account. They will get a ticket that has the login information on it and uh, as well as how much money they've put in. And then what they can do is for that 24-hour uh, period, they can access the tote system basically and make bets from uh, wherever they happen to be at Suffolk Downs. If they're sitting at their table, they don't have to get up each race to go place a bet. Um, it is a convenience factor. It also is a little bit helpful with the um, uh, COVID situation in that there's, you're not touching the self-service betting machines and you're not interacting as often with the tellers. Although obviously um, Suffolk Downs has um, COVID um, protocols in place to make these safe. Um, so I'll turn it over to uh, Chad Bork now. Thank you, Alex, and good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, so, as, as Alex has stated, Amto provides the embed service uh, to their clients, in this case Suffolk Downs, uh, which allows patrons to wager on their mobile phones, tablets, or um, their, their laptops. Um, so what you would do is, um, after making the deposit, um, you are given secured login credentials and able to access uh, the, the account and place wagers. Um, once you are done for the day, uh, you would then cash out with the teller. Um, so it, in its simplest form, it, it really is just having kind of your, your own mobile teller uh, window with you. Uh, the site will only um, be able to be accessed through uh, using Suffolk Downs Wi-Fi network. Uh, this is to keep the wagering 
uh, within the confines of, of the property. Um, at the end of the day, your account is automatically deactivated. Uh, all your data does run through Amtote's backend system, so um, all, all the account data will uh, will be on record with Amtote. Chad, I, I know I asked uh, about if if the Wi-Fi would uh, would work out to the parking lot, but I, I guess I'm told that that's not the case. It'll work on the apron, but not out in the parking uh, lot. Is that correct? Yeah, so I'll ask um, Chip if you want to go ahead and, and respond to that. Um, yes, uh, you know, we, we've got to run some additional tests, but the Wi-Fi uh, network is, is pretty concentrated, you know, in the building and the apron. Um, but we should, you know, I mean, it is, I, I, I would have to uh, actually get on the Wi-Fi network and go out into the parking lot and see if it, it if it still has any uh, the capacity still exists. My my strong suspicion is it doesn't because the Wi-Fi network doesn't always work in every area of the building. So it would be a stretch for it to work in the parking lot. But um, we're happy to verify that for the commission if if that's required as part of this. Uh, Mr. Tuttle, I don't think that's required, but today might be a good day to go test. What do you think? <laughs> the, and in fact, our meeting's likely to go long enough that if you want to do it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I uh, I got some shoveling done with my earbuds on uh, during the 10 to noon period. So <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, does that answer your question, though, um, Commissioner? Okay. Um, I have the benefit, of, and I think most of us, of a, of a briefing on this, which we appreciate Chad and Dr. Lightbound to just understand the technology. Um, it really is a customer service enhancement, and as Dr. Lightbound points out, perhaps an important enhancement, you know, should our COVID-19 uh, restrictions need to um, extend out in next year's simulcasting um, environment. Uh, Commissioner Stebbins, are you leaning in? Yeah, I am, Madam Chair. Thanks. Um, I had a quick question, and I, I know as, as the team at Suffolk rolls this out, they're going to have lots of good communications to their patrons who are going to use this for the first time. Uh, my interest or my question, uh, Chip and Chad, is around, I come, I use it. If for some reason that day I do not go back to the window and cash out, what happens if I come in the next day and say, oh, I forgot to cash out. Is the money still available to me? Um, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to have, you know, have those types of confronta confrontations or circumstances. But, uh, you know, Chip, if you can speak to the approach you, you plan to take to make sure that doesn't happen uh, as this new product gets rolled out. Um, yes. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Commissioner and, and, uh, but let me answer your question first, and then uh, if I could indulge the chair to express my appreciation for your service, I'd, I'd like to do that. Um, so the, you get the, that ticket that you get when you, you go up to the window and say, hey, I'd like to use MBET today. You know, here's $50 or whatever your deposit is. And then as, as through the course of the day, your, your, your phone, your, your mobile device is basically your own self-service wagering terminal. And at the end of the day, if you, you, you still need that ticket, right? So that uh, the same way you would take a betting ticket or a betting voucher, uh, that ticket is really your, the same, you know, in, in the very same way that you would, you would redeem a, a winning ticket or a voucher. Um, and that ticket remains good. So that even if you don't cash out at the end of the day in the 24 hour period expires and you're, you're no longer active on the MBET platform, you know, even a week later or a few weeks later, you can go in with that ticket and cash it for whatever your remaining balance is. That's great. Thank you very much, Chip. Can I, can I ask a question before um, we move on from that topic? Yes, Commissioner, which, absolutely. Which my question was in all of this, that under that same hypothetical, there's two different monies that might be on that though. So some of it's a ticket, so as if it were a paper ticket, winning ticket. But what if I don't bet everything? I put $200 in, I only bet 100. So maybe some of it's like a winning ticket and then some of it is just my cash. So some of it could be treated as you get it later, you get it like a lost ticket, something like that. 
how's the money that I maybe don't get at the end of the day treated that's not a bet, it's just my cash I haven't gotten back? That remains in your balance, Commissioner. So if you were to put $50 in and, and let's say you wagered 20 and lost that, you know, you, when you went to cash the ticket in a few days later, that $30 balance would remain on the ticket. But then what if I forget about it? If you forget about it, it it's, it's the same as if you have a, a winning ticket on a race and, you know, you lose that or forget about it. There's, there are procedures in place uh, where you can appeal. Um, you, you come in and say, hey, I lost a ticket. Here's when, you know, on this day. Um, and then uh, we go through at the end of the year um, with outstanding tickets and the commission approves requests. I believe this is the case. I don't, I don't want to misspeak. Um, so Alex, please, uh, Dr. Lightbaum, please correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. But there are ways um, for patrons to redeem lost tickets based on uh, attesting that they were there in a certain time of day. Uh, we have cameras, obviously, in the facility that uh, track who comes back and forth to the mutual windows. So um, that's, that's how lost tickets are dealt with. And then, of course, at the end of the calendar, um, after a certain period of time, uh, and Chad may know this off the top of his head, those tickets become outstanding tickets. Uh, and outstanding tickets by statute revert, any unclaimed tickets become outstanding tickets. Those by statute revert to the purse account that we pay over to the uh, New England HBPA. I, but in my mind, there's a difference. A lost ticket where I placed a bet and cash I put almost to get a debit card for the day. If I never mm -hmm. actually took the cash to put it on a ticket, is it still considered a lost wager or isn't that my cash I should be able to get back some other way? In like other words, it's like a lost deposit, right? Is it like in property is my question. Because some yeah. of it would abandoned property some of it would seem to be a lost ticket yeah so so a lost ticket you know is doesn't become abandoned property until whatever the time frame is that expires but but if if you were you were um let me give you an example that that may help you uh, think through this commissioner you, you are able to come in go to the window uh, the mutual window and buy a voucher. You know, you can give the clerk a hundred dollars and get a, a one hundred dollar betting voucher, and then you can use that betting voucher and putting put that into uh, any self service terminal. And you know, at, at, as through the course of the day, um, you know, as you bet off that voucher, you know, you get your balance returned to you in the form of a slip of paper, in the form of, of a ticket. So, um, you know, similar to uh, you know, casinos paying out with, uh, you know, a ticket, a, a paper slip that comes out of a slot machine as opposed to, you know, coins actually, actually coming out. So, you know, the patrons are quite used to the idea that they have to hold on to their tickets in order to redeem them. Um, and again, so this is, uh, and, and maybe I'm not understanding your question, but there's, there's no distinction uh, between, you know, what's left on your account and, and wins and losses, you know, that, 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 that's the same thing, right? If, if you start with $50 and you, you're successful and you have 80 at the end of the day, you know, you've only bet 20, but you've won, you know, uh, you've won $50 off that $20 bet. Now you have, you know, you have 30 in your account. Now you have $80. You'd, you'd be able to redeem the ticket for 80. And, and if you lose the ticket, you'd be able to come in and tell us and say, hey, I was here on this day and I lost the ticket. And, and you know, we, we have uh, not, you know, we, we really haven't run into problems with patrons uh, who have been refused uh, requests of lost tickets. And if so I can, if I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I can give the, the timing of the um, unclaimed tickets. It's, it's something that um, Chad and I have just recently been discussing because that's going to be coming up in front of the commission in uh, January, probably. Um, <clears throat> every a patron has uh, the entire year after the year they bet to um, claim their winnings off of a ticket. So at the end of that period, if a particular ticket has not been cashed, it becomes an unclaimed ticket. Uh, and as uh, Chip mentioned, there are times when a patron has lost a ticket uh, and they go to Suffolk Downs or Pine Ridge, 
they can, um, a lot of times they can go back on the um, cameras and actually see when they place the bet. But the patron can be very specific about the time and the location and the amount. <clears throat> and then the um, pair of mutuals can go back and uh, verify it. So then at the end of the year, they'll go over it with Chad if there are any that are being claimed by the patron. And if Suffolk Downs and Chad feel that it is a legitimate claim, then Suffolk Downs will pay out on that ticket to the patron. And that's taken out of the unclaimed uh, tickets, obviously. If I may uh, emphasize something on, on Commissioner O'Brien's question, the key, you said that in your mind, it's two different things, and the key is that it isn't. Positive balance, whether it came from an initial deposit or the winnings of a ticket, or, or, or the result of both a balance and wagering that went up and down. The ticket contains the balance, and that follows the same procedure that they, they explain. Um, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's not, uh, um, again, it's not different things. It's, it's, it's a marker into your account, as I understand it. What they issue you when you, when, when you initially fund it is a, a code that points into the balance that you have in that account. And that's what they will give you at the end of the, of the day if you, if you redeem it. And that's what will remain uh, you know, for a, up to a year if you don't redeem it for a year, et cetera. Yeah, to me, there is a conceptual difference that I realize maybe industry-wise this isn't the standard. But particularly when you're moving into an electronic tracking, uh, it would seem very easy to be able to treat it differently. But you know, maybe that's the rule question that I have. But it would seem to me that if you're getting this electronically through an app, there's a much easier way to make sure monies get back to people without putting the onus on them for lost ticket processes. But that's a conversation for another yeah. day. Understood. Yeah, that, that would be a key difference. Yeah, I, I would almost expect with the technology you said you'll be able to identify the patron who still has an uncollected balance, you know, a, a, unredeemed balance and that uh, we might actually find ourselves in a position where you could get get the money back to the individual uh, before that year period is uh, is up maybe that's really a question for for mr tuttle is is there anything in the technology that i don't know a button that could allow you to say request my balance or something to that effect <clears throat> um I'll have to ask, uh, well, I mean, you know, you can request your balance at any time by going back to the window and redeeming the ticket. And, you know, I don't mean to be overly obvious with, with that part of it, but this is to be, um, as, as to further explain it maybe and help, help everyone's understanding, you're not required to show an ID to do this. You're not required to give your social security number. You're, you know, it's not an ADW account. It's not right? ADW. That's important. Yeah. You know, the, they're, they're, the state, the Commonwealth has specific laws and regulations around ADW accounts and how those work. And, and of course, the ADW companies as national entities all, you know, have, have protocols that they follow. So if, if I have an ADW account, to your point, Commissioner O'Brien, yes, you know, at, at any time I can redeem my balance and, you know, they, they can uh, send it to me via PayPal or Venmo or, you know, just I can, I can make a withdrawal from my account. Um, this is, is really basically just turning your mobile device into a self-service betting terminal for the day. So, you know, your cash is being held behind the window at Suffolk Downs um, as if you're, you just basically have a betting voucher, but that voucher, you can bet off that voucher through your phone. And then, you know, at the end of the day, you, you take your voucher and bring it back to redeem it for, for whatever your balance is as, as commissioner Zuniga explained. I do, um, I think I understand the differentiation you're making, but but I, I it may be that uh, it's just terminology here. I I see this as uh, strictly a customer service enhancement uh -huh. where you don't have to get into line um, to make your bet. And apparently, um, Dr. Lightbound said sometimes when the races are so close together, you might miss out on the opportunity to bet if the lines were long. And so they really are doing it from their seat. Doesn't mean they're getting their steps in, though. Um, 
But um, unlike um, the ADW, where and I'm and I'm correct on this, I clarified with Chad and Alex that ADW, anyone in Massachusetts, if they set up an ADW, can bet on horse racing from their couch um, and in within the Commonwealth's boundaries. And in this case, it's a customer service where that um, mobile device uh, can only work for as a means to place your, your bet um, using the amount that you deposit at the beginning of your day from the actual um, uh, simulcast venue at, at Suffolk. Um, and so it really is, is just a customer service enhancement without any, even though it seems more technologically advanced because you're using that mobile um, platform uh, to place the bet, it really isn't um, much more than that enhancement. It's not to dis diminish that enhancement, particularly if it's helpful in COVID-19, but that was the only way I could think about it. And yeah, I, Madam Chair, I see it that way too. I mean, it's, you know, we obviously have a lot of questions about it because it's a new technology and yeah. how does it fit into our guidelines? But, you know, to Dr. Lightbound's point, you know, it's, it's a convenience for the customer. It's going to hopefully draw more people out to physically go to Suffolk Downs and, and spend the day or make some bets. Um, and during this COVID period, it certainly is ease and convenience for me to, to bet without worrying about you know, um, any public health impact. And you know, in, in many ways, it's sort of shifting perhaps to that, that approach to use more um, you know, of our handheld devices, our cell phones, which will of course please uh, the younger demographic. So um, there's, a, I'm sure that that's in the back of the, the minds of, of the simulcast industry. So any further questions on, on this for? Well, just, just a comment, perhaps, um, uh, perhaps Mr. Tuttle would want to um, chime in on this. Um, let me preface it by saying that uh, I'm in favor of this. I think it's, it's as you both point out, um, Chair, uh, a technology that is both an efficiency on, on the operations, a customer service, and, um, and especially it's important or, you know, useful uh, during you know this notion of, of, of COVID and you know the, the, the necessity to maintain social distance etc but at least um, in my mind um, and, and, and this doesn't take me away from my uh, you know feeling favorable about this um, it is at least conceivable that this would mean less need for tellers um, if it's especially if people get used to, um, you know, operating comfortable with the technology on their phones, they would still need to fund it before and after. So you still need a teller, uh, you know, at the beginning or at the end of the day, but you might not need that many if more, the more and more people would use it. Is that a fair um, sort of statement, Mr. Tuttle? Uh, and again, I'm, I'm fully comfortable with the request and in support of it. Uh, but I think that's the one area that I see as, you know, I think it's worth of mentioning. I, I think you raise a, a fair point, Commissioner Zuniga. I can tell you that's not our intent at all. It's it's not, you know, we, we had not introduced this. We, we, we discussed this with AMTO and our tow provider over the course of the summer. Um, you know, we, we got comfortable ourselves with, with how uh, the platform would work. Um, we certainly aren't looking at it as a way to reduce uh, the workforce in any capacity, um, really more of a, of a patron convenience. And, and we're not quite sure how many uh, people will adopt it as a, a patron convenience, but we thought it was worth a, a pilot program. I, you know, we'd be happy to come back in uh, whatever period of time the commission thinks is adequate to, you know, give you a report on how it's working and, and whether it's been uh, well received by our customers or or not, but you know we certainly are are we've worked really hard to try to maintain the workforce uh, throughout uh, these difficult circumstances during COVID, and we'll we'll continue to do that. Com Commissioner Cameron, yeah, Mr. Tuttle, I, I think some of the demographics of your um, 
of uh, your patrons may uh, may lend itself that, that they would be more comfortable continuing with the window. Um, some of them may be like my mother, who still uses a flip phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we all have different, uh, I mean, I still read books, not on Kindle and, you know, yeah. or on, on cell phones. Uh, I don't shop on Amazon, but anyway. <laughs> Thank you for those comments. Uh, but he likes SharePoint. <laughs> yeah, I, I love SharePoint. Yeah, no, the, the, I, I'm not making a direct connection into, into any of that. You, you're totally correct. I believe that uh, it depends on how comfortable the customer base, um, you know, becomes with the technology, if, if at all. And I think the most important part here is the notion that it's really an accommodation uh, and a customer service option. Um, and frankly, in our role, uh, we also need to be different to um, the needs of the business um, in these areas, including even if they become a real operational efficiency. So, which is why I wanted to just both mention and preface it by, by saying that I'm in support of it. Thank you, Commissioner. Ready for a motion? Yeah, I think Dr. Leibon, you would like a vote, correct, on this? Yes, please. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm happy to move that the Commission approve the use of input by separate grounds as discussed here today. Second. Okay, Commissioner Stebbins, thank you. Um, and uh, no further discussion? Okay, uh, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins? Uh, aye. And I vote yes, Erica five zero. Thank you. Uh, and, Madam Chair, um, I'll just take just a moment, but Commissioner Stebbins, um, congratulations on your new appointment, uh, your uh, thoughtfulness and your consideration. Uh, you know, we've always valued it here at, at Sterling Suffolk and appreciate the good faith effort and time um, you've taken to understand the, the racing side of the business. I know the commission you know, has to focus quite a bit on the gaming side, but uh, we do appreciate uh, your, uh, your effort in, in learning about, more about our business and, and uh, helping uh, us navigate through the, the last several years. And um, I will see you on the other side. You're not done with me yet, Commissioner <laughs> Stebbins. I happen to have an interest in a uh, recreational cannabis company in the Commonwealth. So uh, I look forward to, to talking to you in a different capacity. <laughs> well, thanks, Chip. I, I, I'll look forward to that too. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as uh, growing up in Western Mass where we didn't have a lot of horse racing, um, I want to thank you because uh, uh, you did so much to help educate me about racing, uh, as did Dr. Lightbound. But um, what, what was really impressive was the uh, the unique history and tradition uh, at Suffolk Down and all the incredible thoroughbred racing history that that property uh, holds. So um, I thank you for that. Best wishes. Th thank you, commissioners. Happy holidays, Chip. Thank you for um, your contribution today to clarify this and, and uh, wish you the very best for the new year. Oh. Okay, moving on then to the annual report. Is that correct, Dr. Lightbound? Yes, <clears throat> that's the next item on the agenda is the annual report. This does not require a vote. <laughs> um, and if I haven't screen shared before, um, I'll see if I can. Dr. Lightbound, how have you escaped that this year? <laughs> uh, let's see. You have multiple windows open. No, yeah. uh, right. Alex, Alex, you have the right document. Perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Obviously, um, people can read through it at their leisure. Uh, but we want to hit um, kind of the highlights. And um, uh, Chad is here again. Uh, he'll go over the financial part of the uh, annual report. So to start off with, um, there were a couple of milestones this year. Uh, uh, in, this is in 2019. Um, first of all, we apologize for this report being so late. Um, Chad and I were working on it back in March and thought we'd get it on the agenda by April and then COVID struck. So 
Um, we had other things that we uh, needed to attend to. So again, this is the uh, 2019 um, annual report. Uh, this was the last year of racing at Suffolk Downs, which originally opened in 1935. And um, they had a, a wonderful run of racing. The um, commission did have um, sort of a going away uh, at one of their meetings with uh, slides of Suffolk Downs and all uh, near the end of 2019. Um, another milestone was that our Chief Commission Steward, Susan Walsh, was awarded the Pete Peterson Outstanding Steward Award by the Racing Officials Accreditation Program. And um, that was quite an accomplishment on her behalf. And again, congratulations to Susan. Dr. Leipman, if I can stop you there. Um, I did have a chance to, to, to read this report and uh, that part made me smile, remembering, um, recognizing, uh, you know, um, Susan Walsh for that accomplishment, a, a tremendous accomplishment, and her work was just uh, impeccable. So that that really was nice to reading milestones to remember um, her accomplishment. That it was exciting, very exciting to have her honored so much. So now on to the um, Plain Ridge racing statistics. Uh, most of these were very similar to the year before, um, 108 days of racing where we had 110 the day before that, I mean the year before that. Um, the number of races was slightly down because of that. Um, the field, average field size stayed very similar compared to the year before. Um, there was a little bit of an increase in the total purses. Um, and we'll go on to the Suffolk. Um, again, their changes were um, mainly due to the fact that they raced six days instead of eight, which they had in uh, 2018. So again, the number of races was down um, a little bit because of that. Um, their average field size did go down. Um, <clears throat> they um, did hand out uh, almost three million in purses, which was down again just because they didn't have as many days of live racing. Um, our licensing stayed, um, again, very similar. Um, we usually do around 1,000 per track. Um, the numbers at Suffolk were down a little bit, again, just because it was uh, fewer days of racing. And um, our numbers at um, Plain Ridge don't take into account uh, people who might have taken out a multi-year license. The system just can't um, calculate that. So um, I'm always encouraged at, at Plain Ridge that we do get quite a bit of uh, licensing every year, um, which is in addition to people who've already taken out a two or three year license. The um, State Police Investigative Unit continues to be a big part of racing. Um, again, they, uh, their number of investigations and all was similar to years before. Um, there was one ejection and um, they provided numerous background checks and did a lot of uh, fingerprinting. If uh, you recall, that was um, opening of Encore in 2019. So um, the racing unit also helps out on the gaming side with uh, performing backgrounds and fingerprinting and, and other um, staffing needs as uh, is needed with the casinos. On to um, the veterinary services and the um, lab. Um, we have contracted with industrial for several years now. Um, we've had great, um, a great working relationship with them. They're very um, easy to work with. Uh, they have a wealth of knowledge and um, I can't say enough good things about them. Um, at Plain Ridge, we had 11, what we could call therapeutic medication overages. So these are medications that uh, equine veterinarian would use in their daily practice. We just want them below a certain level when the horse actually races. Um, this was down considerably from 2018 when we had, um, in addition to 12 therapeutic violations, we had three, what we would call an actual positive and two high TCI readings. So that was a positive note um, on that side. Uh, at Suffolk Downs, we also um, saw the number of uh, drug violations go down. Um, there were five in 2018, and there were only three in um, 2019. So that was a positive note. 
getting to the um, judges at Plain Ridge, um, their number of rulings and all were very similar to the year before. Um, and <clears throat> uh, let's see. The um, most of the uh, suspensions were relatively short suspension of maybe three days for a driver infraction for interference. Um, in 2018, there were 114 rules compared to 119 in uh, 2019. Um, there were slightly more fines in uh, 2018. Um, and again, there were slightly more racing days. So. Uh, not much of a change there. And in at Suffolk, the, in 2018, that was kind of a bubble year. There was um, one incidence where multiple trainers were involved in a um, claiming violation. So there were 16 um, fines and suspensions that year. Um, and in 2019, it returned to a, a more normal level um, where there were only three rulings and three fines. And those were um, all uh, tied to the um, drug rulings. Uh, let's see. Then on um, the appeals to the commission, uh, if a licensee has a ruling by the judges and they want to appeal it, they can appeal that to the hearing officer. So there was one that um, was appealed to the hearing officer and that was denied. We had uh, one that was withdrawn. It made it to the actual day of the appeal and then they decided to withdraw it. Um, there was a waiver granted and then um, there was one that was ongoing. So again, that's uh, pretty much in line with what we would see in, a, in any given year. And um, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Chad Bork, our senior financial analyst, to discuss the uh, financials. Chad? Could he be on mute? I don't see him. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, before I again, uh, begin, I just want to make a quick note of uh, two adjustments. Um, the first uh, will be the amount distributed to the thoroughbred accounts from the Racehorse Development Fund. Um, the amount there uh, will be $4,427,000 uh, in which will bring the total disbursements to 15 million four hundred twenty one and one hundred and fifty four dollars. Uh, the other is going to be with the Suffolk Downs Capital Improvement Fund. Uh, the program revenue should be one million sixty two thousand um, dollars and the RFR payments are one hundred and one thousand bringing the ending balance to two million five hundred ninety thousand, and uh, these adjustments will go ahead and, and they'll be reflected in the report, and uh, they'll be posted to the to the gaming website. Um, so to continue, two thousand nineteen saw another successful year of uh, racing in Massachusetts, and I thought I uh, we would just share a couple of the the financials. Um, and we'll go ahead and start with revenue. Um, the handle commissions from all tracks um, generated uh, just over um, $814,000. Uh, and this was a, a slight, slight decrease of 4.42% uh, versus 2018. And uh, from uh, revenue from licensing, badges, fees, along with fines and penalties, um, brought in a little over 91,000, uh, which was uh, a, a decrease of roughly 30% um, versus 2018. And um, the, the decrease in these two categories um, can be directly attributed to uh, the decrease in, in live racing. Um, Plain Ridge conducted 1,000 
131 races, and Suffolk Downs conducted 68, uh, which was a decrease of 2.83 and 30.61 respectively. Um, when we look at assessments and association licensing, uh, those brought in um, just around 1.1 million, uh, which was in line with 2018. And uh, to complete, uh, we have our expenditures, which came in a little over um, 2.3 million. Um, that was an increase of, of less than, than 1%. Um, and then uh, we'll move to the handle. Thank you. Um, 2019. Yeah. I just want to make sure, are there any questions for Chad on that? It was just a little hard maybe to follow the numbers. So any clarifications that you need? Thanks, Chad. Sure. Um, so with the handle, um, 2019 um, saw a decrease of 4.53% versus 2018. And, um, Again, much of this can be contributed to um, the decrease in live racing. One thing I do I, I do want to point out is, um, you know, we continue to see a, an uptrend in wagering um, through the ADW providers. Um, again, from the likes of um, TVG, Twin Spires, Express Bets, ADW wagering actually accounted for. Um, basically 50% of the total handle. Um, and that was the only um, handle category that was up um, in 2019. Um, and it, it was up two and three quarters percent. So again, a continuation of um, uh, the generation moving over to um, kind of the internet base and, and the mobile wagering. Um, lastly, um, able to purport, uh, report that the racing div division provided um, nearly 855,000 in local aid to cities and in, in towns where racing activities uh, took place. So with that, I, um, finally, I just wanna give a special thanks to my colleagues in the finance department who uh, assisted with the, the report. Any questions for Chad? And Dr. Lightbound. Um, my only, it's not a question, but it is a, um, an observation. Um, I think these, uh, this 2019 numbers really uh, are, they attest to the fact that this is such a clean meet, meaning um, very few violations, very few medication overages, um, you know, I, I think, you know, those are a number of things. Uh, Dr. Lightbaum, you talked about uh, the outstanding work of our accredited lab, uh, which makes, uh, which really does make the case that when there is an overage, we can demonstrate in, in a way that um, folks can believe that it's been done properly. And the same thing with the uh, hearings that are held by our judges and stewards who are very well trained um, in order to uh, conduct a very professional hearing. So few of them make it to the commission on appeal. Uh, I just think it's, it really is, um, um, it speaks to the good work being done by your staff and um, how professional everyone is um, in the way they do their job. So these numbers really do speak to that. So thank you. It's, it's nice to see it and understand it for the whole year. So. Um, we can understand that that work is just really well done. Thank you. Commissioners, um, I, I don't know if we can take the PowerPoint down or the uh, report down now. Thank you. I just, then I can see everyone's faces. Commissioner O'Brien, Commissioner Zuniga. I'll, I'll just make a comment similar to, um, to Commissioner Cameron's. Um, Thank you for this report. It's a reflection of a great uh, year. Um, it's very thorough and detailed, and um, um, you know we look forward to the next one. Commissioners, all set. 
I, I would just, Alex, if you can remind me uh, who this report goes to. I know it goes to a number of our counterparts over in the legislature and a few other places, if you can remind us where this gets filed. You know, I don't remember off the top of my head. I know it does go to the legislature. And so, you know, we'll definitely do that, but I don't remember the exact spot off the top of my head. Yeah, well, it was good to have and you know, great work to, uh, kudos to you and Chad for the financial team for helping to pull this all together. And Chad does make a good point, um, and I usually try to make it when we do the end report. We get um, support from all the different divisions of the Gaming Commission. Um, ev every division um, contributes to our success at some different level. So, again, I appreciate all of them for their uh, contributions to the racing season, as well as the commissioners. It takes the whole team, right, Alex? It, it does, yes. Good. Well, it's an excellent report and so thorough. And Chad, thank you for the financial analysis. Um, you both bring uh, a lot of clarity to uh, a, a, an area that is filled with detail that a lot of us find challenging. So it's a very thorough and clear report for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Make sense of a, of, um, of a, a difficult statute. So thank you so much. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron smiling because she knows that's a little bit of an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so I think that concludes uh, horse racing, um, the racing division. Alex and Chad, thank you so much. Uh, we're now moving on to the next item on uh, that really is under your uh, purview, uh, Councillor Grossman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm actually going to turn the next three items pertaining to the uh, regulations over to Carrie Teresi, who will walk you through those. There she is. Hello. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioner. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Carrie. Uh, so there are three regulations on the agenda today for a final vote to complete the promulgation process. So I'll just run through each of these. Um, 205 CMR 146.13 is the regulation related to the table characteristics for the blackjack tables. This is the regulation that uh, clarifies that the table layout must read that blackjack pays at odds of three to two or six to five, depending on what odds are being offered at that particular table. This regulation came before the commission on October 8th and you voted to begin the promulgation process at that time. A uh, public hearing was held this morning and that was presided over by Commissioner Stebbins. We did not receive any comments uh, at the public hearing. Uh, we also have not received any written comments. So at this time, we'd be seeking a vote on the amended small business impact statement that's in your packet, as well as the regulation to finalize the promulgation process. Are there questions on, on this? Uh regulation. We've had extensive briefings over the course of the regulation um, promulgation period. So I'm seeing no questions. That's only because of the thoroughness of uh, your work uh, prior to today. So thank you. That means that we do need a vote starting with the um, small business impact statement. Do we have a motion? Uh Madam Chair, I'd move the commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 146.13 blackjack table card reader device physical characteristics inspections as included in the commissioner's packet. Thank you, Commissioner Stevens. Second uh, from uh, Commissioner Cameron. Um, thank you. Uh, with no further questions, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zinica? Aye. Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. And I vote yes. Uh, next, um, do I have a motion on the, the regulation language? Uh, I'd Please. further move that the commission adopt the final draft of 205 CMR 146.13 blackjack table card reader device physical characteristics inspections as included in the commissioner's packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any questions on that? Okay. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. 
Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And Commissioner Stevens. Aye. I vote yes, five zero. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Uh, so the next regulation is 205 CMR 153 related to the Community Mitigation Fund. This is a new regulation that codifies the procedures and guidelines for the Community Mitigation Fund, including an annual review of the guidelines, a procedure for entities seeking emergency appropriations, minimum requirements for the execution of the grant instrument, and the assessment of reasonable administrative costs to the fund. This regulation came before the commission on October 22nd, and at that meeting, you voted to begin the promulgation process. Uh, this um, a public hearing was held for this regulation this morning as well, presided over by Commissioner Stebbins. And again, we did not receive any comments at the hearing or any written comments. Um, so we would be seeking a vote on this one as well on the amended small business impact statement and the regulation in your packet. Um. Madam Chair, if I can just add, I know that uh, they carry working alongside Joe Delaney and the team brought this uh, these changes before our, our local community mitigation advisory committees, as well as the subcommittee on community mitigation. And uh, uh, at all three meetings, uh, there was uh, support for uh, the changes by the committee members. Thank you for that update, uh, Commissioner Stebbins. And before I forget, thank you too for presiding over uh, this morning's regulatory process. Um, we will miss you covering that aspect of our work. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so with that, are there any further questions, observations, comments? This is, again, we thoroughly vetted. I'm glad that um, it was uh, vetted externally too with important stakeholders. Do I have a motion? No, Madam Chair, I would move that the commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 153, community mitigation fund, as included in the commissioner's packet. Second. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zinica. Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Oh, yes, so five zero, thank you. Moving on to the RAG itself. I further move that the commission approve the final draft of 205 CMR 153, the Community Mitigation Fund, as included in the commissioner's packet, and authorize the staff to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Thank you. Was there a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner. Any further questions? Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. And I vote yes, five zero. Thank Carrie you. Carrie again, thank you. All right, you. and finally, uh, 205 CMR 133 related to the Voluntary Self-Exclusion Program. Uh, these are administrative changes that ensure uniformity in the process of managing and maintaining the voluntary self-exclusion list, specify who is deemed a designated agent and has access to the list, clarify the application's contents, and refine the qualification requirements for providers of services offered by the VSE program. This one also came before the commission on October 22nd. Uh, uh, yeah, October 22nd, and at that meeting, you voted to begin the promulgation process. It was also part of the public hearing held this morning. Uh, we did not receive any comments at the public hearing or any written comments. So again, we'd be uh, seeking a vote on the amended small business impact statement and the regulation included in your packet. Any questions for Carrie on this final reg for today? Okay. Um, again, we'll need a, a motion on the small business impact statement. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 133, voluntary self-exclusion as included in the Commissioner's packet. Second. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, 5-0. Great work, well done. Um, 
Thank you, yeah. Todd and Carrie, and, and I know many team we members. Oh. Madam Chair, we just need oh, so to sorry. Let it break itself. Thank uh, you. My, my apologies. Thank you. Uh, I further move that the commission approve the final draft of 205 CMR 133 voluntary self-exclusion as included in the commissioner's packet and authorize staff to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so second with Commissioner Stebbins. Now, any questions? Thank you. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. And I vote yes, 5-0. So now I can say thank you. I know it took a big team effort to get these three um, regs through. Uh, Todd and Carrie, thank you, and all the, the uh, team members who helped substantively. So thank you. Thank you. Um, before we move on to the next item, I do just want to bring your attention to the two documents in your packet that follow that last reg. Um, we updated the forms related to the VSD program, the enrollment form, and the petition for removal, just to align with the changes that were made to the regulations. We're not seeking any formal action on these, but um, we just wanted you to have a chance to see them. And I know that Mark and Teresa are on now if you do have any questions about them. Thank you. Did everybody have a chance to look at them? I, I uh, think they're on like page 123 and 124. They reflect the, um, that work. Well done. There's Director Vander Linden. Hello. All set, commissioners. Yes. Thank you. And thank you for sharing them in the packet today. Thank you. Great work. So um, I think, Carrie, do I turn back now to, I, I turn back now to Councilor <laughs> Grossman. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. I'll take it uh, from here. So now we're on uh, item D the fourth item under legal. This is a review of the enhanced code of ethics and for your consideration commissioners we have a variety of proposed amendments to the enhanced code of ethics. You'll recall that the, the first edition of the code was actually adopted in February of two thir 2013, the second edition in January of 2018 and it certainly seems a healthy practice for an organization to periodically review and refresh uh, its policies and procedures. And that would certainly apply to the Commission's Enhanced Code of Ethics, which of course governs many aspects of our daily conduct at work. So it's particularly important that these policies be clear and current and fair and reflective of the Commissioner's and the Commission's collective val values, ideals, and the law itself. Um, and so it was through that lens that the Chair and Commissioner Stebbins and I set out on a review of the code the amendments before you are proposed as a means to enhance the language of the code. Um, it is not intended in any way to specifically increase or decrease the rigor of any particular area, though that may be the impact of some of the amendments you may ultimately uh, approve of. And with that, um, if there are no uh, introductory remarks uh, by any commissioner, I'd be happy to walk through the proposed adjustments that are uh, before you, pointing out any areas that may be of uh, particular interest in my mind, of course, welcoming any thoughts uh, and comments along the way. I can uh, pause there for a second or otherwise just keep going uh, here. My sense was, although ordinarily I would share this document, I don't know, Madam Chair and Commissioners, if it would be easier actually just to keep us all uh, moving in this format so you can see each other and maybe engage in more of a robust conversation when necessary. If, um, if people, do they have access um, to the document? I do. Uh, I think everybody mm -hmm. has access. I see Commissioner Cameron has it in printed form even. So um, I think that's a good suggestion. It really does help for us to see each other's um, reactions. And, and if there's a, a, a comment, I think rather than holding comments and to the end, um, we should we should make it an active uh, conversation, as if we were sitting around a conference table in public. I think that makes good sense. So I'd be happy to get started. Thank um, you. As we do have a number of uh, proposals before you, and uh, we'll just take it from the top. Paragraph uh, section one um, really is a uh, an effort to just clarify some of the language and the ultimate goal here was just to be clear that uh, 
the state conflict of interest law, chapter 268A and 268B, is really uh, still the, the, do, the body of law that uh, controls the baseline of all ethics compliance for the commission and that this code is intended really just to supplement that. So there are no changes in there per se that was really just an effort to clarify uh, the language of paragraph one. Moving on to uh, paragraph two, and I'm just looking over at my other screen, not uh, ignoring anyone here or anything like that. Um, you know, this, so this is the continuing obligation uh, section of the code. And by way of comparison, uh, section 20 of this code discusses a related topic, but not identical. And we'll get into that momentarily, but I just wanted to point out what the proposed amendment uh, to paragraph two is. You'll see in the stricken language, um, the proposal is to remove uh, the duty of each commissioner and employee to review and assess the conduct of uh, fellow commissioners and employees under this code and the ethics laws. Um, and the reason is, is that it could inadvertently create a, a culture of one having to report on a potential violation of someone else that pertain to very complicated and nuanced areas of the law, that being the state conflict of interest law, which could be difficult for someone to navigate. It's difficult sometimes to navigate for yourself, uh, even more difficult if you were to attempt to do it uh, uh, relative to someone else's conduct. So the thought here is that we remove the uh, obligation to report relative to someone else's conduct. Of course, we keep the obligation to review and assess your own conduct in light of this code and the, the ethics laws. And we say that instead of whenever there's any reasonable doubt as to whether something um, could be a violation or not, that if you have any question as to whether your own conduct is in comport with the law that you need to ask um, and inquire further. So those are the changes here. And by way of contrast, and I mentioned section 20 already, that section deals with a duty to report if you observe or are aware of a vi that someone else has violated a criminal law or directly violated chapter 23K. So that's a whole different area and we will get to that momentarily but we by this proposed amendment to section two we're not attempting uh, to allow people to ignore certain things that may come to their attention just to really create a more fair uh, and equitable duty uh, that we place upon each commissioner and employee i i asked the question in the two by two on this one since duty report is such um a, a topic of discussion when it comes to public safety these days. But um, it, I, I did receive a good clarification from our general counsel that this is really just talking about ethics and your own ethics, um, you know, and of course your ability to ask, is this okay? Very different than a um, some kind of a criminal matter. So um, I once I, I received that clarification, I was um, certainly supportive of this change. Excellent. Um, in that case, why don't we move down to section five, which is um, page two of the document. And you'll see a lot of uh, red in there, but really all this is, is a reorganization of the existing language just to clarify uh, both the materials and, and documents that have to be offered to and provided to uh, the commissioners and employees uh, for their reference, as well as uh, streamlining the training process and clarifying how that will work. There really are not any substantive changes proposed here, uh, though again, there's a lot of uh, red. The, there are two things that were changed though, just uh, for everyone's reference. And the first is, that we said that the provision of the documents to commissioners and employees upon their employment has to be within 30 days instead of 14 days. And what that does is it just aligns that requirement with the actual uh, ethics training that we also provide to the employees so that it can be all done on the same time schedule and that we don't have separate uh, 
uh, time schedules. The other thing we added in here is just that uh, all employees be provided with a copy, copy of the summary of the conflict of interest law, which we do provide to everyone uh, annually. But this just helps uh, remind us that it needs to be also provided upon employment uh, with the commission or within 30 days of employment. So those are really the two big changes. The other piece of language we added in here is really just a reference. You'll see it's under paragraph, there's paragraph one and two in part C, um, which is uh, the big red paragraph. We added language that says that the commission will also provide applicable training under the conflict of interest law to advisory and subcommittee members as deemed necessary. That is a practice we already engage in. We're just codifying that practice here um, so that everyone is aware that we, we do that and that we will do that and continue to do it. And paragraph, uh, what will, was paragraph D will become paragraph B. I'm just moving down to the bottom of page two. Um, we just, outline all of uh, the things that will be uh, included on the sign-off form that everyone will be asked to execute after the training. So there's really no change there. It just identifies all the documents uh, oh, and all the items that are already on the form. Section uh, six, this is on uh, page three. Um, the only notable change here is in uh, part B, where we added uh, the reference to chapter 23K section 3V. You'll recall that's the section of the law that talks about commissioners and employees being prohibited from owning stock or being employed by anyone who holds a license under chapter 23K. As a, an enforcement mechanism that we presently employ, we ask em commissioners and employees annually to attest to the fact that they're in compliance with that section. So all we're really doing here is adding a reference into the enhanced code uh, to uh, reconcile it with our present practice. Section seven, uh, towards the bottom of the page is our definition section. And there were a number of adjustments to some of the definitions uh, that have been proposed. The first is to the definition of the term consultant. And when looking at this definition, it's important uh, to also have a look at the definition of the term employee, which is two definitions down from there. And what we say is that an employee essentially is not a consultant. So consultants are specifically exempted from the definition of employee, which is why it's important to be clear who we believe uh, or we define consultants to be. And so we haven't really changed what uh, or who a consultant is other than to just clarify that if someone is a consultant that this code doesn't the enhanced code that is doesn't apply to them uh, but that the commission by way of contract can make either the whole code or any provisions of this code applicable to any consultant so we have the flexibility on an ad hoc type basis to review and assess a particular situation with a particular consultant and add in any provisions that uh, might be beneficial, as opposed to painting with a broad brush and making the whole code applicable to all consultants. Next is the definition of direct or indirect interest. And this comes up in the context of uh, ownership in the uh, licensees and what have you. The, the law says that one is not allowed to hold a direct or indirect interest in uh, licensees. So again, it's important to define what that term means as it's not defined in chapter 23K. And as you see here, there's only a, a highlighted provision. I haven't stricken it because I wanted to take uh, some time to talk about it and think about it. And if, if there is a consensus here today, we can take action. But the, the language that's been highlighted, you'll see pertains to uh, an exclusion from what a direct or indirect interest is. And we say that a, it does not include an individual's interest in less than 1% of publicly traded companies. Um, but by way of contrast, there's also a black and white rule, and this is the law that says that we're not allowed to own any stock in any licensees. So this particular provision, and I don't recall the genesis of it specifically, um, 
I don't believe it really has any application whatsoever. It seems to be super, superfluous and could actually uh, prove to be confusing uh, to people. And so the proposal on the table is that we take this out. Uh, before I did that, I, I wanted to uh, float the idea to make sure that there are no um, unintended consequences of doing that. I haven't been, been able to think of any, but that's something uh, to just talk about before we take action on that provision. If, if I can comment on that, because I, I was going through this with, uh, with Todd in the briefing, uh, and I think he raises a good question uh, as to the, the notion that perhaps this creates a little confusion. Uh, there's, there's one aspect of publicly traded companies here that, may, uh, that, 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 uh, that we should inherently be considering here. If we're talking about gaming related publicly traded companies that we license, that's a clear, absolute um, preclusion elsewhere in chapter 23K as well as elsewhere in, the, in this code. And if we're talking about any other publicly traded company, um, the question arises as to why would that be necessary? Um, if, if you have uh, stock in, in, in other publicly traded companies unrelated to gaming, let's say, the threshold would seem arbitrary to me when it comes to ethics. Um, so we can either remove the language or specify whether this applies to publicly traded companies that are not gaming related or licensed under the chapter, which is really, a, a, and, and, and have that allowed to, to, to us and employees, or whether the intention was, and I don't recall myself, the genesis, to have no ownership of any publicly traded companies, more than 1% that would create potentially other, other conflicts. I, I cannot say what those would be, but, but that's the question. That's a distinction that I think we need to be thinking about. Do you remember um, any discussion around that point, Commissioner? No. I, I, um, have, I have always wondered about that uh, prior to even joining, um, having seen that threshold. Um, uh, Todd, did you, I hear you saying, I, I, I'm not sure if you have a clear recommendation for us, and maybe we need to, maybe we table this discussion on this definition until we get to the other item. Does that make sense to talk to about them together? Or? Um, which other item? There, there, isn't there another section where um, it refers to the fact that we could that we could have perhaps up to one percent interest in a in a I think it's a correction that you're recommending today in well, I, in one of our licensees. I think this I, is this is the provision here. Oh, um, I, oh okay. This is the, oh I guess I thought it was in a separate as well. My apologies. No, it's all oh, oh I realized I'm not sharing my screen, so highlighting it doesn't do any good. But um, <laughs> the. Uh, um, Thank you. It, no, this one just talks about an individual's interest in less than 1% of publicly traded companies. Um, and it is p possible that the intent was, as Commissioner Zuniga just described, to really allow for an ownership stake in a non-gaming licensee uh, company that happens to perhaps be a vendor of some kind. Right, because, oh, I see. I guess I'm, I'm my apologies, my notes, um, I should have had them in front of me. Because right now, the way it's written, we could have an interest in. We, we do. Well, well, I would say no, only because there's a, a broader rule that says you're not allowed to own any stock. So the question well, would be- Under the statute. Yeah, and we actually mm -hmm. said at the beginning of the definition of direct and indirect interest, it means an ownership, stock ownership, loan, property, leasehold. So we say stock yeah. uh, there. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, but the I, term doesn't include an individual's interest in less than one percent of publicly traded companies, which would be stock. I, I can I can provide an example. There's actually a personal example, um, and you know, since we're talking about ethics, that's um, that's relevant. My wife is an employee of a publicly traded company, and um, 
he, she um, owns as part of the, their stock plan, uh, as part of the retirement, has own stock in, in the company that the company contributes. Um, I haven't checked, but I'm, I'm sure we're nowhere near 1% um, of, of that very large uh, company, uh, but, but conceivable <laughs> that that could have been a scenario envisioned here where we would not have to worry about unless there is a direct or indirect ownership in another company that then begins to raise the question as to whether there needs to be a, a, some, some kind of disclosure or divestiture or whatever. Um, and, but, and for the record, it's a completely unrelated to any gaming, I know for sure, yep. yes. um, mm -hmm. uh, yes. company, which is what would appear to me to be uh, part of the sentence capturing because the way it's worded it would be any publicly traded company not just gaming related or or with a interest or rather a vendor or some kind of relationship to a gaming related uh, company what is your recommendation todd on you know I think perhaps we should leave this one as is and come back to it um, at a later date. It hasn't caused any issues uh, to date, and I think it just needs a little more review, um, perhaps on its own. And so, for because it, there is still a, a bit of uncertainty here. So let's let's not can, just delete it. Can I time. can I ask though? Is there an easy fix to just exclude publicly traded companies that are, are licensees or or um, or does it is it more nuanced than that? Well, um, you know, the, the statute talks about um, not holding a direct or indirect interest in a licensee under this chapter. So that's, I mean, that is the rule at right. present. And so we're just defining what that means. But if you then take this term, the term does not include an individual's interest in less than 1% of publicly traded companies. Of course, you wouldn't be able to, with that prohibition in the statute, we can't have any stock in the licensees. So I wonder how, if this, if this provision competes with that statutory provision. I guess I was trying to articulate that it might not. Right. If we're talking about non any other non, non gaming. Non and I agree gaming. with I agree with you entirely, Commissioner Zuniga. So I do think we need to make sure that Commissioner Zuniga's scenario is permitted, but make it clear that this doesn't suggest that if we were all lucky enough to own up to one percent of one of our licensees, um you know, in, 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 in no, stock. Of, of other companies, non-licensee companies. There's well, no, there's that, but also the opposite, which would be strictly prohibited. I just wonder if it, if it just needs to be, the term does not, I know that we have a strict prohibition, but if on first glance, this looks like it, it's, it competes with that prohibition. Well, only because it's excluding, um, the direct interest interest definition. Um, I Commissioner mean, O'Brien. I, I, I think we yeah. could be clarifying it this by saying that publicly you know traded companies not licensed yes. under 23K. I, I think that's exactly I would mm -hmm. I would suggest that. Yeah. And that therefore the exclusion would be relevant and not in conflict with the other prohibition. Yes. And that that people could own up to 1% of a publicly traded company that was not a license under the chapter. I would, I would make that suggestion too. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, I see you kind of nodding. Do you, do you agree that that might be helpful? Yeah, Todd and I talked about this a lot in terms of, you know, why it was there. And um, yeah, I, I don't think that creates any issues. In fact, I think it solves it, but um, I don't know, Todd, I, I would think, do you want to, do we propose that with sort of an asterisk going forward today to be double checked, Todd, to make sure that putting the not in, not otherwise regulated, solves the issue? 
Yeah, well, I mean, I think that does absolutely. I mean, that I think is okay anyway. You're allowed to own right. stock in a company that's not licensed under 23K. That's right. That's not at all an issue. The question I think for me is what, how the commission interprets licensed under this chapter, uh, that phrase, because the rule uh, specifically is that commissioners employees shall not own or be in the employ of or own any stock in a business which holds a license under this chapter. So um, it clearly only applies to companies which have a license under chapter 23K. Um, and a company that doesn't, Amazon or something like that, certainly doesn't count. You can own as much Amazon stock as you want. Uh, but it's a company that is licensed under 23K that becomes the question. And whether we read licensed under this chapter to mean just the gaming licensees or any licensee, like a vendor, a racetrack, all those folks, to the extent they're publicly traded companies. I think we mean both. We, we mean anybody who's licensed under 23K, what we've called in the past as, as big L or little L, you know, the, the gaming manufacturers, etc. If, if, if you could license them, it applies. By the way, your example of, of, of Amazon, the way I read this current um, language, including my proposed provisio, would limit our ability to own more than 1% of Amazon stock, even if we could afford it. Um, the, way, the way I see it is written, because it says direct ownership would not apply to somebody's interest in less than 1% of publicly traded companies. Um, it would limit, um, our ability to owe more than 1%, the way I see this written. Okay. Um, well, I... Do you, see, do you, do you, yeah, you, do you I, now understand what, what I've been sort of trying to articulate? I do. I've always kind of given it a different read, though. I mean, I, I viewed this as meaning, first of all, this is limited to whether you have a direct or indirect interest. It doesn't place any other independent restriction um, on you. So if you don't fall into a direct or indirect interest, then there's nothing to be concerned with. Um, and so I've never read this to mean that it applies to every publicly traded company on the market. It's just ones that happen to be licensed under Chapter 23K. And what effect that has on employees and commissioners ability to own stock in those companies. And so if you're a company that's not at all licensed under 23K, then I, I think employees and commissioners can own as much stock as they want, 1%, 20%, whatever you want. Um, so I've kind of looked at it a little differently. And for that reason, maybe instead of making a change to it right now. We just kind of hold this for a moment until we're all comfortable with it. That's fine. Um, and we can revisit it. Yeah. It, it's not an imminent or urgent matter. Nothing's come up or anything like that. And we want to make sure we get it right, of course. We don't know what we're getting for Christmas yet. Right. Well. <laughs> or Hanukkah. Yeah, I'm not getting anything. I already know what I got for Hanukkah. So. <laughs> or that 1% uh, of some public. Maybe, maybe, it, maybe, it may be that it's not just the highlighted part, but the rest of the sentence that, that may be incomplete um, yeah. in terms of mm -hmm. qualifying. Uh, but, but let's revisit it, as you suggest, uh, because they can, there's, there's a read, uh, I guess I made my point already, that it might apply to any. Well, and, 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 I, and I agree with, with that. And so I do think, well, we can table it today. I don't think we should table it for long. You know, I think we should revisit it sooner than later. But I do think it, it sounds like you're being thoughtful about the license and, and our ability to make sure that, that we can attest correctly about our, our ownership. It is, a, I, I think it's a prohibition on license altogether, any licensed um, company altogether. But again, let's revisit it. I think Commissioner O'Brien and you have had some good conversations and I think it's worth really 
drilling down on it. This was not something uh, Commissioner Stebbins and I spent with Todd much time. Um, it was a discovery. And I can I could only say is I saw this as um, before I, I joined, joined the organization as competing and of course didn't have a practical problem but wondered what it meant. So, um, you know, from that personal point of view, I don't know, Commissioner O'Brien, if you did the same thing, but it did seem um, to be a little bit um, at odds with the, the statutory prohibition, at least on how we read it. So, yeah, because um, I know we want to move on, but um, the, the exclusion uh, of mutual funds is, is a much more intuitive one. Right, which, and very uh, consistent with the Ethics Commission's right. um, practice right. because we don't have ability to control um, right. Right. control yeah. factors. So yes, and that's that's very clear here. So that's important, right? Thank you. Oh, my computer right. Should, okay. <laughs> we can, um, if, if we may, I guess we can keep moving on to the definition of employee, which begins at the on the next page. Um, <laughs> And again, we're just, this is, we're clarifying what the practice was. And I believe the second edition of the code, this was contemplated by the commission, but we recognized it was not as clear as it could be in um, excluding members of our advisory board or subcommittees um, from the definition of employee, such that they are not subject to this enhanced code of ethics. And to be clear, that doesn't mean they're, um, excluded from any ethical considerations, they're still uh, deemed special state employees. So chapter 268A does still uh, apply to them as it applies to any special state employee. So there are still ethics uh, considerations, just not the whole enhanced code of ethics. The next um, area for discussion, if we kind of scroll down to the bottom of this page is the definition of significant relationship um, and this comes up in the context of the, the uh, discussion about conflicts of interest. And one is not allowed to engage in any financial, um, uh, uh, situ uh, any particular matter in which they're or uh, an individual with whom they've had a significant relationship's financial interests are uh, implicated. And we'll get into that section in a moment too. But the, the question before the commission here is whether the tense um, of the language here in significant relationship is as it should be. And just by way of uh, uh, reference, I went back and took a look at section 3M of chapter 23K, which is where the term significant relationship is used in the statute. And it says that it, it applies to anyone who has present text, a significant relationship. Um, with someone else. So you'll see, and we reference this, I think, in three places in the code. This is um, the first place um, where we wrote in there in number four that it's anyone with whom a person shared, and that's, of course, in the past tense, uh, an influential or intimate relationship. There was some uh, discussion about adding shares or shared, um, but uh, the, the, uh, the prevailing thought may be that we just make it present tense as the statute uh, talks about and make all references to significant relationships to a situation that you are presently in with someone. So this would read, if, if that's agreeable, that it's anyone with whom a person shares an influential or intimate relationship. I think you have a consensus there. Okay. Uh, so, we will strike the word shared and replace it with shares. Um, along those lines, and I just mentioned um, this, if we then go up to number three in significant relationship, it talks about former spouses, domestic partners or life partners, so ex uh, folks. Um, those are all, of course, by definition, people who there were past relationships with. So perhaps consideration should be given if we're moving towards making this a present tense um to removing that if to, or to the extent we find it to be inconsistent but if that is viewed and it can be as such a limited um carve out because those people are in such a special uh place in one's lives 
that we keep it. Um, we at least need to recognize that most of the definition applies to present tense, but that one is in the past tense. Commissioner O'Brien? So yeah, Todd and I had a long conversation about this, <laughs> um, trying to reconcile the tenses in the different areas. Um, and I do think we should be consistent. Um, you know, I was trying to do different hypotheticals in my head, and it's like, you know, you could have had a significant domestic partner, life partner, spouse that was over 25 years ago, and you don't see the person, and you have no idea, and it's, you know, no more than a close friend. So to me, doing this catch-all of past tense and pulling that in, where we're doing present tense for the other, I feel like it should be consistent. I, I feel like the past tense goes too far. But that, that's, that's what I conveyed when I got briefed on it. I, I, I don't necessarily disagree with it, Commissioner O'Brien's point. Um, the only one in, the, in that specific line that might be of some interest is uh, a former spouse who might still be paying some type of um, you know, financial obligation to, or what have you, that could be viewed as competing. In that case, you have a, wouldn't you have a financial interest? Wouldn't that fall in financial interest category? Potentially, it would still come up under appearance issues and things like that. So it's not yeah. as though, I mean, if your ex-husband or ex-wife, even if it's from 20 years ago, came before you for a license, I mean, you'd probably need to disclose that at least. Yeah, <laughs> but in terms, yeah. Of the, in terms of the absolute, I mean, Bruce, we were talking about this, that if you had something like that, it would seem that the definition of financial interest um, in one salary, gratuity, or other compensation or remuneration definition, it would seem to fall on that because then you do have an interest in it because helping this person out might help you get out of your alimony. Right. And so I wasn't bothered by changing the tent because that still seemed like it was caught by the financial interest definition. I agree with that. I agree with that assessment, by the way. I think it, I think that way it covers it. I I like it. I I like it. Um, making it more con consistent. If uh, to if it, I think Commissioner Stebbins' point is addressed through other through other right. analysis. Financial interest definition. Mm -hmm. So we don't see a conflict if there's no financial interest with that former. That is Todd's point of appearance of conflict as opposed to an actual financial conflict. Mm -hmm. right. So it's just to be clear, the consensus is then to take it out? Okay. Commissioner Cameron, are you comfortable with that? If there are other vehicles no. to do? Yeah, absolutely. I'm fine with that. Yeah. Okay, so we'll take three out and then we'll delete the word shared and it will replace it with shares. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, we're down to section nine. This is the conflict of interest section. There are, again, a number of amendments here, but um, I, I'm hoping uh, we can easily explain what we've done. Um, the first is in paragraph A. Um, this is really just to bring uh, this provision in closer line to the state law, and it's easier really for training purposes, A, just to note that a conflict of interest applies to yourself too, if, if you personally have a financial interest. And we didn't say that here because that's covered under 268A, but here it's just easier to add that applies to the financial interest and something you know about, so it's to your knowledge. Um, so th those are just two... Um, additions. And then you'll see, um, although I can't remember if I just did this or this is in your draft, there's um, the part where we say have or had a significant relationship in the last line. So we delete the or had and it would just read with whom they have a significant relationship. So be oh, it wasn't deleted in this version. So okay. Yeah, so con that's consistent. Yep. Okay. Um, so we get down to paragraph C and D, and there are some similarities between C and D. We'll take them separately, but at the end of the day, we are trying to do basically the same thing with both. And um, the distinction with paragraph C that's important here is that it only applies to commissioners, and it only applies to situations in which you're making a licensing decision. And 
this uh, provision is included in chapter 23K and it, it says that commissioners must recuse themselves from any licensing decision in which a potential conflict of interest exists. So the terminology potential conflict of interest does not appear in the state conflict of interest law. That is special uh, to chapter 23K. Um, but um, it, it makes sense to have a mechanism tied to the uh, mechanics of the state conflict of interest law to handle any of such situations that may arise. And the, the closest um, comparison is when there's a so-called appearance of a conflict of interest under 268A chapter 23B3. In that case, um, one is required to file a particular form which is referenced here um, in uh, the new language in red, and that form is to be filed with your appointing authority, not with um, an executive director or anyone else. You file that form, regardless of who you are, with your appointing authority. So the proposal here um, to uh, help us navigate situations in which a, which a potential conflict of interest exists is to say that if that situation arises, a commissioner can file a, um, notice of an appearance of conflict under 23b3 with their appointing authority and the commission will have deemed that uh, that potential is dispelled so there's no longer any potential because it's been put out on the table out subject to uh, the sunlight everyone can see it everyone knows about it and the appointing authority then of course has the ability uh, to make a, a determination if they so choose as to whether uh, the person can continue or not continue on in that particular situation. But at the end of this paragraph, you'll see we also added language that says, because an appointing authority essentially is not obliged to necessarily um, make a determination, that a commissioner who files such a disclosure with their appointing authority must announce the filing at a public meeting of the commission so that it's all out in the public. Uh, if this type of situation were to arise. So that's um, the additional language you see here in paragraph C. Um, it may be helpful, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, just to go on to paragraph D before we have discussion because there's a lot of similarities uh, between the two, although the language is slightly different. Uh, paragraph D pertains to commissioners and employees. And again, there is language in chapter 23K that addresses the situation here, uh, and which is not addressed in 268A, the state conflict of interest law. So again, it's unique to uh, the gaming law, but again, raises similar issues to the so-called appearances under 23B3. So um, what we have said here is that in the event that a commissioner or employee finds themselves in a situation um, that could give rise to an appearance of conflict or uh, in which their impartiality may reasonably be questioned, and that's the language that's in the statute, impartiality may reasonably be questioned, that they may file this disclosure under 23B3, and that, as it does with appearances of conflict under state uh, law, shall be deemed to dispel any such appearance or any question as to whether their impartiality may reasonably be uh, called into question. And like before, we say that such a filing shall be made with one's appointing authority. And in the case of the commissioners, your appointing authorities are your statutory appointing authorities, whether it's the governor or the attorney general or the treasurer or the combination of the three. When it comes to most of the other employees of the commission, that would be the executive director who is our appointing authorities. Um, and when it comes to the executive director, it is the commission who is the appointing authority. But, and whoever that happens to be, that's the individual or group of individuals you would file the disclosure with and the ultimate decision as to whether you could continue on would be with your appointing authority. The change that was made to this section was because there was a, a bit of a, um, a, a tricky situation that we uh, unintentionally created whereby commissioners would be required to file a disclosure with the executive director who would then be called upon to make a uh, decision, which creates an awkward situation um, to say the least in which someone 
uh, would have to make a decision about their superior, uh, essentially, under a conflict of interest law. And that's not a great uh, setup. So the amendment here is designed to remove that and to bring this situation into closer alignment with the existing uh, vehicle that's used under state law to address these kinds of situations. And again, when it comes to commissioners, uh, the requirement would be to announce publicly that you have filed such a disclosure with your appointing authority. So that's paragraph C and paragraph D, and I think it might be a good time to pause uh, for discussion, uh, comments, or any questions about what the proposal is. Questions? I think, you, I think it's well articulated uh, by, by you now and, and by the changes here, something that um, it took me a little while to kind of get sort of uh, understand really the um, the question that was being brought up, um, I kept thinking of the personalities in the, in the prior executive director, but I think the, uh, the, the amendments here are appropriate and, and reflect um, a good process. No problem at all. I, I, um, when it was briefed, I thought this made sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Um, in that case, we can uh, keep moving along. The next change was to section 11. It's just a real uh, minor clarification. Uh, it requires if, if anyone, commissioner or employee, gets offered a gift that they report it for their own uh, protection to ward off any suggestion that someone actually kept a gift. It requires the reporting to one's immediate supervisor, where commissioners don't have immediate supervisors here at the commission we added in that that could also be filed with the general counsel. Um, and that would just be on record um, in case of any future issues that arise. If we keep on going down to um, section C of uh, section 11, we talk about travel expenses. And this is uh, already in the enhanced code. The adjusted language here is really just a clarification of the rule and ties it even more closely uh, to state law on this issue and uh, points out that if you were to follow uh, state law, that acceptance of either travels, travel expenses or a reimbursement of such expenses or the waiver of any such cost um, shall not be considered a gift. And that is consistent with state law on the matter and we are really just following that um, here. So that's really just a reworking of that language but not a change in the policy. Can I just add one observation on that? Uh, uh, and commissioners, we all have the great help of uh, Jamie on travel and conference setting, but there are regulations um, under uh, Chapter 268A where um, if, if there is any element of, of um, third party support, whether it's a waiver of costs, because often we don't, we use our own internal budget to cover those costs, but if there's any waiver, uh, there it may trigger an obligation to file file a disclosure with your appointing official, and it does require a determination from your appointing official. So just keep that in mind, uh, and J and we'll we'll remind Jamie of that requirement. She knows it, but just uh, she's she's a great gatekeeper to remind us um, for that, uh, to, and it, it should be done. It must be done, I should say in advance, uh, but that's, that, that doesn't happen that frequently for us, but if, if they waive, um, that's also has value. So is that fair to say, um, Todd? So we'll remind Jamie so she can remind us, okay? Thanks. Right, we're all on the lookout. That's the key yeah. to this whole code. You know, yeah. it's, it's hard to remember all of this, so it's yeah. important. That's why we train everyone and we yeah. talk about it regularly. But she's so uh, helpful on that front, so. So the next section, uh, section D, talks about use of employee cafeterias or dining rooms. Uh, the commission, I believe, reviewed this within the past, e I mean, it might be more than a year, although it feels like it was within a year or so, but it's in our employee handbook. So now we're just migrating it over to this enhanced code too. And it allows employees who particularly work at casinos or in the casinos to make use of the employee uh, cafeteria of dining rooms, provided 
that they pay a market price for any of the items that they purchase. It's our understanding that oftentimes the casinos will offer some discounts or uh, good deals on their meals to their own employees or even uh, perhaps offer them uh, for free in certain circumstances. And we, of course, can't do that. But if we do accept um, the uh, food at, or beverage at market price, there's no violation of the rules. So we're just codifying that. Uh, there are also a couple of typos here that I would, I would just kind of take out. There are a few extra that's in here. So I'll, I'll delete those um, as well. Thank you to Commissioner O'Brien who keenly uh, caught those. Um, section 12, that's just clarification um, of the unwarranted privilege rule, just tying it more closely to chapter 268A. It's discussed there. There's no real substantive change um, to that one. Um, section 13 uh, talks about use of the licensee facilities and particularly staying overnight at hotels uh, that are owned or operated by the licensees. And here what we have done, uh, and this kind of harkens back to the part where we talked in the conflict of interest section about the executive director being required to take some action uh, pertaining to her superior. So we wanted to remove that type of uh, scenario, and which we initially had whereby the executive director would have to approve of a commissioner staying overnight um, in a hotel. So we, instead, the proposal is we just say the commissioners um, shall not stay overnight. It says no commissioner shall stay overnight in a hotel of any kind for any reason, um, period. And we separate that out from any other employee, like a gaming agent, for example, who may do so with express authority of the executive director, director of the IEB, or the gaming agent division's uh, chief, provided that we pay for uh, those rooms. So that's the, the, uh, the purpose of the change in section 13. Looks There's good. Well, Commissioner Kim, all set. This one makes perfect sense. There's no reason to stay at a licensee's facility. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's a, that's sorry. actually um, a clear improvement or, or um, a further uh, additional enhancement here, right, Commissioner Cameron? Oh yeah, I never thought that we that there was any need to do that ever. And it's just good clarification. Thanks, Todd. Section 14 uh, has a similar amendment, uh, whereby initially in the present language, um, a commissioner could place a wager in the course of their official duties if they had the approval of the executive director, director of the IEB. Um, and uh, to uh, remedy that situation where a commissioner would need the uh, permission of a subordinate, we instead changed the rule um, to essentially say that commissioners can never place a wager um, in a casino, which of course is the law anyway. Uh, we carved out a very limited exception here that an employee can place a wager in the course of their official duties. Um, the theory being that it would presumably be part of an investigation of some kind or some type of compliance uh, uh, effort to ensure uh, that uh, the integrity of a particular game um, is being met. But the thought is that it would never really have to be a commissioner who would engage in that type of activity, really just a, an employee of some kind. And so what this does is it, it just kind of codifies the fact that no commissioner will really ever be placing a wager in a casino. There is no sure. undercover work for commissioners. No undercover work for commissioners. There goes my one skill that I obtain about switching dice. Go down in history. Down, yeah. I always advertise it at the one and only time that I might ever do it. This is the Zuniga rule. That wasn't even undercover. That was right out in, in public. It was in full view, yes. Yeah. In plain view. So, um, in, in a very limited, I just want to be on the record, very limited circumstance on a test night. So uh, this is just to clarify, um, really, a, a clear rule. Again, very much like the overnight at the hotel. Correct, Commissioner Cameron? 
Yeah. Absolutely, no need <laughs> at all to place uh, wagers as a commissioner. I, or uh, wagers, I'm thinking of sports betting. Because that's something I did participate in, in undercover capacity. But this is very different. No need as a commissioner. So that's clear. So good. Thank you, uh, Todd. Do you want to continue on to 15? Yes. So paragraph 15, uh, just a, a couple of real minor adjustments. Um, one is just to clarify that an employee working at a gaming establishment may purchase food or drink within a publicly accessible area at the post and menu prices, uh, which was already the policy. But this is just the distinction from the employee uh, dining areas where you can't just pay the posted price. You have to pay market price. But if you buy, if you're at the casino and you purchase uh, food or drink at out in public at the posted price, then that is uh, permissible and not considered a gift or um, or actually uh, doing anything in violation of the code. If you scroll down in the same section, uh, section four, uh, again, this gets into the situation where a commissioner was required to obtain the approval of the executive director. So we changed that. Uh, this pertains to the scenario in which someone wants to go to a gaming establishment for a family or social gathering or civic or charitable uh, event or what have you. And we do have a mechanism in place that allows for that, provided that amongst other things, you, uh, a regular employee gets permission of the executive director. Uh, this would require commissioners to notify the executive uh, director of such and then announce such filing at a public uh, meeting that you were uh, going to the casino. So I should just point out that um, this is just now putting a notice on, on file, which was recommended by Todd. Um, I don't think it precludes a commissioner from maybe taking the additional step of filing, you know, some kind of an appearance disclosure with their appointing official to just say, I'm going to be you know, at the licensee for you know, my cousin's daughter's wedding or whatever, um, just to, you know, make sure that you're, you're clear on the record. But um, I thought this was a, a really reasonable recommendation and it wouldn't preclude additional steps. Um, this is because this is a measure that isn't, doesn't stem from a statutory prohibition, but from our enhanced code, correct, Todd? That's right. Okay. Um, paragraph B of this section directly below, um, I don't believe you have any marks on the, the draft you have in front of you, but you'll recall that this section pertains to a commissioner's involvement as an officer, director, or fundraiser with um, an educational, religious, or charitable organization that receives significant funding from any gaming licensee. I wanted to raise this um, to seek to clarify um, a, a bigger question about this, and that is, whether this is intended to apply solely to such service in a commissioner's personal capacity, or whether it was intended to actually cover um, such service in the course of a commissioner's official duties as well. Um, it was my sense for what it's worth that this was intended to apply to um, one's personal involvement in any such organizations because that's really where the conflict of interest law um, is designed to uh, to to jump in and help moderate behaviors but in this type of situation where a commissioner is providing um, a service to such organization in the course of their official duties i would suggest that the concerns that the conflict of interest law are uh, intended to address are really limited. Um, and so I think a clarification as to that point would be helpful uh, here. Are we talking about, it has to be a charitable event. Is that what, not just any other kind of a, an event at the licensee's premises? Well, it's not an event. It's really service on a board. This okay. is um, this is letter B B. So okay. I think Todd gave a great example to me. Um, you know, we're quite proud of the fact that um, Director Wells is on the Niagara board. Yes. Yes. Um, this doesn't pertain to her, Commissioner Cameron, because it's only with respect to commissioners. But suppose you know you can't. I can't use Commissioner Stebbins. Well, I can. 
because he's still here. He gets a request today to serve on um, uh, a gaming um, licensees, a, a nonprofit organization that is made up of regulators, right? Um, really is serving the industry. It, it would be um, uh, really uh, about your official capacity. And I believe that there are ethics the Ethics Commission has made rulings that would be consistent with what Todd has suggested here. Um, with that said, um, there's always other uh, prohibitions in terms of confidentiality around our own business, et cetera, on serving on those boards, but it doesn't, it doesn't involve the potential conflicts that I think you were probably intending when you put that in back in the day. It really is around the, um, the nonprofit organizations that we serve personally, I, I serve on you know, various private nonprofit organizations and coming here uh, to the Gaming Commission, I did my due diligence to make sure they weren't invested in any gaming um, um, uh, companies. And so I, I think that's what you were hoping for on that, but we haven't had any invitations yet to serve on a nonprofit. Um, are we talking something like IAGA? Or exactly AG, right. yeah, you, he said. So you, know, you don't think a commissioner should do that? Is no, that the, op the opposite. I'm the saying opposite. opposite. Okay, because invited. Should, you should be able to do that. Because it's I in see. our official capacity. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see the distinction. Okay. Yes, and it, versus if we were on a nonprofit that had a substantial financial interest. In yes, gaming. very big difference. Yes. Yeah, because okay. then it would be for our personal, perhaps personal gain yeah. versus our professional uh, duties. Got it. And yeah. so if, we'll make that change. I think that's a good suggestion, right? Yes. Okay. You know, for in the interest of disclosure on the exact conversation, I have been um, invited uh, uh, to be a member, uh, a board member of the to part, uh, of the National Council on Problem Gambling, and have not done so to be, you know, a, bo a board member to be in, in 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 full compliance of these provision with the, you know, without necessarily having had the benefit of this discussion that, you know, it was not perhaps meant to be as part of my official uh, duties. Um. So it is a very real situation. It's, um, and uh, this is a helpful clarification, I think, uh, ultimately beneficial to the commission. And that's what was intended. Okay. Um, Paragraph C, you'll see there's just a deletion to 11C. The, the theory is that 11C references the gift restriction and the, the thought is that um, compensation or honoraria um, are really not travel uh, reimbursements. So it was somewhat perhaps of a misplaced cross-reference. So that's the purpose for that deletion. And E is really, again, just a clarification that um, you may participate in civic or charitable activities this applies to commissioners um, or employees that do not interfere with your uh, independence of judgment i was just adding in there related to the commission i mean if you're involved with something else that affects your independence of judgment, that's, <laughs> that's your business uh, but we're only concerned with ones that will affect your judgment here at the commission <laughs> um, okay so Section 17 deals with um, unlawful conduct if um, someone happens to be uh, charged or ultimately convicted of a misdemeanor or a felony. The statute, uh, this is right in Section 3 of Chapter 23K, says that in certain circumstances, we have to suspend that employee um, and certain circumstances, they have to be terminated. Um, the, what's interesting, though, is that the section um, we realized after careful review does actually not apply to commissioners. And the reason for it, I believe, is that the decision as to whether um, a commissioner should be suspended or removed from their position is really up to the governor, uh, not up to the organization to decide. And so um, in that event, um, what we say is that a commissioner would have to report to their uh, uh, appointing authority that they have been charged um, with such a, a crime, but not to the executive director. 
Um, otherwise, the uh, rule remains in effect uh, for the rest of us as it should. So that's, uh, that's the purpose of that amendment. Um, paragraph 19 just adds, you'll see the commission into the category of uh, individuals and entities with whom someone would have to cooperate in the event of an investigation. Um, and I think the last section I just wanted to touch on is section 24, which is on page 12 of the code. And it talks about um, violations. And this language was derived from section three of 23K, and it relates to a scenario in which the governor could remove a commissioner for cause, essentially. Um, and there's a whole uh, body of jurisprudence related to removing an appointed official from their position. Uh, the intent here, I believe initially, um, was to just give the other commissioners a mechanism by which to convey the uh, existence of any of these scenarios that are described in the statute to the governor. But when we went back and read it, 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 doesn't, it didn't quite say that. Um, it may have added more of a, a duty or a burden than was intended. So the language you'll see in here is intended to really <laughs> clarify the obligation that a commissioner or a group of commissioners would have to make a certain report. And just to walk through it um, quickly, uh, sections one through, uh, and this is Roman numerals, one through five are the exact language in the statute uh, that the governor may use to remove um, a commissioner if any of those items are in existence. Six, uh, we added in, so that's not in the statute, but that re it relates to, of course, a violation of this code. And one of the keys to the amendments is that it's not incumbent upon the commissioners to make a definitive finding that another commissioner has done one of these things. But just to conclude that there is essentially evidence for the governor to consider that one of these things may be in existence. And the standard that we've tied to this is essentially the substantial evidence standard. And the language before you says that if a majority of the commissioners agree that information exists that a reasonable mind might accept is adequate to support a conclusion that another commissioner has engaged in one of these particular behaviors or activities, then they shall, after providing notice to that other commissioner, report it to the governor. Um, and the, the important thing here is that this is a shall. Um, so if, if three commissioners uh, concluded that there is evidence of one of these things, they shall report it to the governor after providing notice to the third. And this is the type of thing, presumably depending on the situation, that could actually be addressed in uh, executive session. We'd have to, if, if for whatever reason we ever find ourselves in this situation, we'd have to look at on a case-by-case -case basis. But uh, there is language in uh, the open meeting law that may allow for such a discussion. But this would mandate uh, that group of commissioners to take action uh, if there was evidence of uh, one of these six uh, are, are we are we using the term reasonable mind instead of reasonable person because it's plural? There's more than one commissioner, or is that so a term? That's this is the exact link. Instead of saying that if a majority of commissioners agree that substantial evidence exists, right? We we use the language that defines what substantial evidence is. So this comes to the term reasonable mind. Reasonable mind. Oh. Um, I'm always familiar with reasonable person, never mind. Yes. Um, and in fact, I think we use reasonable person elsewhere in the code here, but it was just a way to tie it to an actual legal standard. Um, and, you know, so it's subject to discussion. We could make it a reasonable person, of course, but that's where it came from. I just wanted to explain that. Well, if it comes directly from, you know, uh, it's used elsewhere and it's applicable, I have no problem. I just personally never heard the term. Yeah, it's it's an interesting um, it's an interesting way to think about it, but it comes up, of course, in our work all the time, particularly in the hearing contest uh, context, 
when we have to look at whether there's substantial evidence. And of course, the commission adjudicating any number of matters has looked at whether there's substantial evidence. So it's a pretty well understood term. And this is just how it's legally defined. Um, so it's- if not, I could, know, it, oh, Sorry, if I could just add, I think that shall, there was always a, a uh, obligation, affirmative obligation to make a referral to the governor. The difference that I saw was that the language as it existed before suggested that the commission had the power to make the um, determination of the, or the, the findings that are outlined in the statute, where um, ultimately in a removal process that the governor you know, would be exercising, it would be the presiding officer, who would be the governor, that makes the determination of the evidence. So um, in this case, the, you know, the commission would be more likely to know about something. So, you know, there's a, a now a tool that the, a majority of the commission could come together and say, you know, gee, we seem to have made a decision or that there is this substantial evidence. And then as you had before, make, you know, affirmatively make a referral to the governor. Then of course it would be up to the governor as to what to do with that. Um, so it really is reflect, it reflects the process of removal um, more accurately. Um, and then, but the other thing is the fairness factor, right, Todd, where the commission would give notice to the, the commissioner um, as, as well. That's right. And that was, that's a, that's a great description of, of what uh, the driving intent was behind this proposal. So, yeah. But I'm with, I'm with Commissioner Cameron. I would not have known reasonable mind either and uh, for whatever reason, but it does, it's, it is in, um, aligned with, with substantial evidence as, in terms of its definition. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go to our other um, uh, legal mind. Commissioner O'Brien, you're, you're comfortable with, I think of all of the changes, this one was probably more of a of, um, of a challenge to to write, and I thought Todd, you did a superb job on it. So thank you. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. There was there's only one other um, proposal that I, I thought we would get to quickly here, um, and that's in section 25, the post employment section, where we talk about um, how long one would have to wait to uh, be issued a license or registration by the commission in the event that they were dismissed or terminated for a violation of the code. So if we have to terminate someone because they did something impermissible under the code, um, we say that they, at present it says you have to wait two years. Many people, including commissioners, have a two plus year cooling off period under law anyway. So that really wouldn't have any effect to say that you have to wait two years. Um, so in effort to give some effect to that, we say that the two year uh, waiting period would be after your statutory cooling off period. So if you were terminated from the commission for violating this code, you'd have to wait three, four or five years uh, before you could be licensed or registered. Uh, to work at a casino. And hopefully we'll never have to deal with this either, but it's just uh, while we're at it, we might as well. I love Commissioner Cameron's expression. It just kind of blossomed. No, no concurrent sentences here. No, no, it's consecutive. <laughs> yes, I see that. <laughs> you got the hammer twice here, that's it. I, I just have a quick question on that, Todd. If someone is booted off the commission, then what authority does the code then have over them? Um, no. Or is it that the, the, that the, so the licensing division would now be prohibited from licensing that person under this? That's right, that's what we would do. But, but in Massachusetts. Yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Cameron. <laughs> I suspect they may have different roles in different states, but that's, I'm, I'm fine with the, uh, the, the uh, consecutive here. Yeah, no light sentences. Um, if you're, I mean, you know, if someone gets terminated for violating the code, 
it's probably yeah. going to be a unique situation to begin with. Yeah, in that scenario, the coterminus versus the parallel might be the least of the issues. <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> so then, um, I, that is the last uh, comment I had. Um, I can turn it back over. Um, if there's any further discussion, we can hit on any uh, other comments or questions. Uh, otherwise, ultimately, uh, it would be uh, something that the I think the commission should take a vote on as to whether to adopt the amendments. And then, as you'll recall, this code gets filed with the State Ethics Commission. So we'd have to update it and then file it with uh, that body. Before we take any action formally, I just want to thank, well, one, Todd, for your thorough, thorough work here. Um, you, you had made edits and allowed me the opportunity to chime in. And Commissioner Stebbins, um, I want to thank you for um, all of your contribution. While you didn't necessarily um, add comments today, you were, you know, a um, wonderful um, contributor to the, the thoughtful changes that Todd proposed today. So thank you for your attention um, on this. You know, again, I think Todd set the stage right, that you know, this was really uh, thoughtful um, several years ago, thoughtfully done, and it's been updated, and it's probably a, just a good um, habit to review this important document on a regular basis to make sure we commit ourselves to the standards that, that are expected. Commissioner Stebbins? Yeah, um, thanks, Madam Chair, I would agree. Um, a great job by our general counsel and uh you know thanks to you uh i know this has been your bailiwick this has been in your background through your years of public service so um your input was uh incredibly helpful um i know this started off as trying to make some simple corrections but i'm glad that we took a chance to really do a top to bottom review and update a lot more than i think was originally on our agenda um, to keep it current. So uh, I thank you for that. And uh, again, thank Councillor Grossman for his good work and uh, uh, his incredible drafting abilities. Wow. That's Thanks to all of you. Praise. We all participated and it was a very thoughtful and well, any question I had had really been thought out thoroughly. So I, I, I do appreciate the work of, of all of you. I guess I'd like to have ended on maybe the construction report or the annual horse racing report, but this was business that it's, it is a good closer to get done, especially because Commissioner Stebbins did contribute and, and given, um, I wanted to make sure he could be part of today's process. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that uh, we, we took the time today to, to get through this. And uh, I think Todd has, does suggest that it would be good to formalize. I know we've had a couple, one, at least one matter that's outstanding. And then there's been one change, I think one amendment that wasn't um, uh, in our, our uh, document today, but you noted it. So with that, I don't know if there is, if, uh, unless there's further discussion, if there is a motion on this matter. Commissioner O'Brien, are you thinking? Um, certainly, if I go back to the agenda, see how we can. Um, Madam Chair, I would propose that the commission vote to adopt the proposed comprehensive amendments to the Enhanced Code of Ethics uh, included in today's packet and as discussed. In Second. Any um, clarification or amendment? We'll just come back and review the clarification of the publicly traded companies threshold matter. Mm -hmm. yep. Commissioner Stephens, you're all set? Yes. Okay. Then again, thank you, Todd, and thank you to all who um, uh, patiently listened today. It does affect the entire team, so very helpful for you to stay on. With that said, um, Roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And um, this may be a final vote.
or Commissioner Stebbins, you want to stir things up, Commissioner Stebbins? <laughs> well, I'm just <laughs> thinking it's not going to apply to me here in another couple of weeks. So no. I'm sticking the rest of you with it. No, uh, I'm happy to happy to vote uh, aye also. Thank you, and I vote yes. Five zero, Erica. And um, before we turn to the next item, Commissioner Stebbins, thank you for that last formal action. Um, and now we will turn to uh, the commissioner's update, correct? Mm -hmm. And and this does involve Commissioner Stebbins, uh, so it's just a formal vote, the last formal vote. We'll turn to Commissioner O'Brien and Commissioner Stebbins. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I start this off with an apology and a mea culpa. There was a miscommunication between myself and HR in terms of getting the draft in the packet. Uh, we didn't make substantial changes, um, but I can, um, and Bruce, correct me if I miss anything, but we, we didn't do significant reforms. What we really did was tweak them to be more relevant to, particularly for the ED, as opposed to a non-exempt employee, and particularly for this year, being calendar 2020, um, and the fact that Karen was put in as interim and then appointed this year without the benefit of having gone through a formal process where she set out particular goals for the year, things that would be normally part of this process and you would harken back to those as part of this. So this might, what I suggest is I'm gonna go through what we propose, maybe some of the discussions about the dates that we as a body can agree on in terms of timing, in terms of care and self-evaluation, our evaluations, and then the public hearing. And then um, what we may wanna do is put on for January 14th, the first public meeting in January, final discussions about what our form is gonna look like. Again, we didn't do a lot of changes to it, um, but as we, Bruce and I talked about this, people may feel differently about how or if they want that form to change and the mechanisms for doing the actual review. Um, but what I can do right now is simply say that the, the original form that was disseminated that had been used for years when Ed Bedrosian was the executive director, um, really it was ministerial changes to make sure it was, Karen would be self-evaluating for calendar year 2020, not on a fiscal year basis, um, that um, she, it, it makes a reference to the goals and how, to, how did you do in progressing toward those goals, but we simply populated with not applicable this year because she was not given a chance to give any goals in the beginning of the year. Um, it does give her the place, obviously, to set goals going forward for the next calendar year. Um, and then the, really the three areas that we propose adding to this for this year, um, because she couldn't set goals, but we don't want her to not be able to talk about her accomplishments. There is another form that HR and management have been using to do these quarterly check-ins with employees, and I kept referring to it as the purple sheet, which had a number of you know, other questions to ask an employee kind of more regularly as the year goes on. And one of them um, was which, accomplish which significant accomplishment or contribution to the MGC this calendar year um, have you contributed to and which of those are you most proud of? And so that we propose adding in this year um, for Karen so that she can talk about what she thinks she accomplished as interim and director, even though it's not an official goal that we're gonna be gauging her on whether she attained it or not. Um, and then breaking out into goals for next year, agency related goals and personal goals. And so one would be introspective in terms of does she has any particular goals as ED and manager that she wants to accomplish on a professional basis versus what are the two to three goals that you set for you to accomplish for the agency as a whole. Um, but other than that, the form looks um, very similar to what was given to the former executive director in terms of asking uh, her to self-evaluate her communication skills, her personal effectiveness skills, her management qualities, and her interactions with others. So it's, it's, what it does is it's the same form we've used, it's simply calendar versus fiscal, um, and then it does add in significant accomplishments and personal assessments on that because she was not obviously given the chance to set those out in the beginning of the year. And Bruce, I don't, let, let me know if I left anything out. No, I, I think you covered it. It is, uh, again, to Commissioner O'Brien's point, it, we didn't change the, the, the base form over, 
overly dramatically, uh, just some, some ministerial changes. Uh, but the real uh, meat of this was what we, Commissioner O'Brien called the Purple Page, which I think is for the first time giving us uh, and our ED a chance to talk about how they want to um, improve professionally, what goals they're setting for the agency, as well as a review of the goals. And it gives um, the commission the chance uh, when we talk about her performance to also have a discussion about the goals that she has put in her self-assessment and how she views the work of the commission and the team going forward into the into the calendar year. So, you know, that's really the big standout change. And, uh, you know, thanks to, to Troop D and Natasha for both helping uh, Commissioner O'Brien and myself kind of tweak that and make it relevant. Uh, but I think it's um, a good solid document, again, used in the past. And now we've tweaked some of the, uh, uh, you know, goal setting that all the employees are using uh, to have it specifically relate to the uh, executive director. Questions? Oh, sounds, sounds reasonable, sounds appropriate. Um, this is the year that we've had to improvise. So this is one more document that we've needed to do it. So I, I thank the two of you and the team that assisted you with uh, being thoughtful about this. And I just thank you for the work and it sounds great. I agree. The, and the only thing that maybe I have missed, I haven't thought correctly about that, that the um, evaluation and compensation process would be on a calendar basis, but it sounds as though, and, and not surprising, uh, given it also deals with compensation, that it's that this has been was expected to have been done on a fiscal year basis. Historically, yes. When we looked at the forms, it was historically done on a fiscal year basis. But we'd had that conversation earlier in the year in terms of whether to go forward with Karen on uh, an annual based on her start date or to stick with fiscal. And the consensus at that time had been to do the 12 month look back, even though it was gonna fall on a calendar and, cycle. And, and do you think with that now with reviewing the document, Commissioner, that you would still think that's appropriate or should we have that discussion on the 14th as well? Whether we need to sh that we shift well, it, it back to fiscal year versus calendar? I think that might be a question for um, going forward, you know, yeah. whether an in interim six month and then we're back on a fiscal as we move forward with her as ED. <clears throat> That's uh, what I was wondering, yeah. Right, and that could be a discussion as we move forward. You know, do you have a small one and then it's stretched out to, to sync up with everyone else? Um, okay, so we'll plan on that for the 14th. So it's possible that she could do a half year, um, right. set goals for half year. Okay, excellent. Yeah, if the commission wanted to go back to that cycle of fiscal year as opposed to calendar. So Commissioner Zunica, will you think about that too, if it's important to get keep it on the fiscal year basis for you know, fiscal purposes, or if we could shift yeah, to well, the. I, I don't see a real imperative. I think it's a matter of preference. Um, okay. You know, so I'm finding okay. the way, frankly. All right. Excellent. It sounds good. And, I, and I'm excited about the purple page. I know. Um, I was too, actually. Recently, <laughs> I thought it was actually a pretty, pretty good idea. Thoughtful, I was happy huh? people were doing that with their supervisees. Um, so the only, and then the only other discussion really is um, how, the machinations for how this goes forward in terms of when Karen gets this form and does the self-evaluation, um, the recommendation that I had and that Bruce had when we were talking with Tripti and Natasha about this was if she's instructed to return it to HR and then HR disseminates it to each of us so we can each do our individual assessment of her. And then HR could disseminate our individual assessments back to her. Now, compilation, et cetera, that she would get an individual assessment from each one of us. And then there would be a separate public meeting to do an overall assessment that we would need to do because of the position that she's in that would talk about our performances, et cetera, um, but mindful of public records laws, exemptions and privacy rights that would attach to personnel records, et cetera. Um, it's my understanding in the past, compilations of assessments were made. Um, Bruce and I were talking about how that would work, what that would look like, et cetera. It just doesn't seem to me to be a good process. Um, and it seems to me that the executive director should get the benefit of knowing what each commissioner thinks 
I mean, heaven forbid there be outliers one way or the other. She should have the opportunity to sit down one-on-one -on -one with that person and talk about what those issues are. And that can be done one-on-one -on -one with one or more commissioners yeah. if the commissioner or she wants that. So we didn't really want to go forward and continue with that idea of just getting one summarized review. But we obviously wanted to take it to the full board to commission to see what you guys thought. And, and the idea was that we would still have some kind of, we would, we would benefit from the one-on-one, -on -one, but there would still be a compilation of some kind by HR on... on it would, no, so yeah. that's just the, the compilation would really be us. Um, oh, Tripti is here now. Um, what we had talked about, there were two components historically to how the commissioners evaluated the ED, and one was purely numeric. It was breaking these various general categories of communication, management style, et cetera, and gauging them on a score of one to five. That's purely math. I mean, so if the question is, um, and Todd, I know this gets into maybe other questions of, you know, how we want to go forward at the public meeting, but it would seem to me HR simply compiling the median and or the range of those to be presented at the public meeting. And then we each can give our summary of what we think of Karen, to me would be the better way of publicly discussing her performance without having someone go through the exercise of subjectively deciding how to merge everyone's comments about her. Yeah, I think um, the compilation was, uh, as you just clarify, uh, uh, included the comments, the, sum the summation of all the different comments. Um, so it was not um, just limited to the, to the, mm -hmm. the numerical uh, exercise, which wasn't part of, part of the deal. I'm fine with this process. Uh, you know what, what? What you suggest, I think it would enhance the the feedback. So so long as we don't preclude, it doesn't become a at the expense of a robust discussion in the open meeting, which which is the purpose of the the review to be done in public. Which I know could could can, can be awkward, but uh, but it's it's part of the deal, really, mm. part of the structure that we are faced with. I think what we were, and Bruce, jump in, please, but we were yep. trying to balance having a vigorous process publicly, but also acknowledging that there is a component that even the public records law acknowledges is allowed to be kept um, exempt. And so we're trying to do this in a way that's robust and public, but also acknowledges that yep. there is that component to this. Todd and I were talking about, you know, exactly what the mechanics are and the forms, et cetera, that, that you know, could be shared. Now, it doesn't mean, obviously, that the five of us take see the other four's evaluations at the meeting. That would mean that document is public. Um, but to me, the, the benefit of her being able to individually see what we say, and then we as a group publicly talk about that, I think satisfies both those requirements. But I don't know, Bruce, if you wanted to comment also. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. And, and Todd has dug us out some very useful information, uh, both in terms of case law as well as practice. And, uh, you know, even looking back to our, you know, what I saw was our last evaluation of an ED, which was quite some time ago, uh, we, we did have, you know, honest discussion in a public meeting. Um, but again, you know, some of those documents weren't included as part of the packet for the purposes that Eileen just explained. So um, I think it, you know, the, the process as we're thinking about it helps Karen as a professional uh, to understand how her bosses kind of view her performance. Uh, and at the same time, gives her some thoughtful feedback, allows us to weigh in. And again, the new wrinkle being now having a conversation in a public meeting, you can assess the goals that she's laid out in this kind of whole new piece to the uh, to the review and assessment of her work. I think it's thoughtful. And, and I would have my camera off too if I were Karen. I, I think Karen is appropriately <laughs> recusing herself. Oh, <laughs> she's got cat. her cat. And the cat's visiting. <laughs> you can, this is very awkward, so I figured I'd make it less awkward by jumping out. <laughs> Karen, I know. If, Karen, if, if we um, if we ever do this back in in real life again, you have permission to bring your cat and hold okay. the cat <laughs> for that Cooper, <laughs> that comfort cat. Yeah. There you go. Um, um, so I'm out think, again. You finish okay. up. 
Thank you. Um, we're almost we're almost concluding yes. our meeting, but um, so the only right last timing. Okay. The timing. So it sounds like commissioners um, O'Brien, you're going to take this on now on your own. You'll have the document to share with us for further mm -hmm. input on the 14th. We'll mark it up onto the agenda, and it seems as though we maybe at the next agenda setting meeting you could make a recommendation about how we might schedule next steps and and how right. many meetings that you imagine this would take. I have no problem with us um, you know, pushing this into the new year. It's important to get it right. Um, it was right before, but you know, again, I think you know your your set of eyes looking at this with the benefit of Mr. Stebbins past eyes. It sounds mm -hmm. as though you've got you know some enhancements that that Commissioner Stebbins think will be really helpful. Right. So and getting Karen's input in terms of how much time does she need realistically to complete it. That's right. And, and, and us as well, so that we can do it in a meaningful way for the meeting. Yeah, we want to be fair all around. So no vote on this. However, before we um, take, oh, actually, Commissioner Stebbins, you might have one more official vote. I just realized that. I, you were very generous at the beginning of the meeting, but this is a public record, Commissioner Stebbins, so I do invite you to share your parting thoughts for, for if, if um, Elaine Driscoll were here, for our archives. Um, this is an opportunity for you to speak on the record. Um, you'll have opportunities to speak off the record in our you know, um, informal, uh, compliant um, uh, uh, meetings but um, please and don't feel pressed on time everybody relax um, well I, I will be mindful of everybody's time um, first of all let me say it was um, as I sit as I was sitting here and I'm looking at the date and I was reminded that in about another month it was 30 years ago that I left uh, what I thought was going to be the best job I ever had and um, come today to sit here and realize maybe that wasn't true 30 years ago because um, this has been uh, an incredible experience. Um, I'm really humbled by the opportunity to get to work with everybody on this incredible team. Uh, and that includes, you know, um, staff that were with us and have now left for other pursuits, as well as um, uh, my other former colleagues from the commission, uh, Chairman Crosby and, and uh, Judges McDonald and McHugh. Um, uh, it has been great over the last eight years to not only get to know all of you personally and professionally, um, but to, uh, to really enjoy working at a place that has a true sense of uh, family and teamwork. Um, you're all incredible. I have learned so much from each and every one of you. Um, you know, I, and I respect you all so much as professionals and uh, you know, getting to know each of you personally, uh, I'm gonna miss Colonel Cameron's stories about her days in the New Jersey State Police, and I'll miss Commissioner Zuniga's paella and his turkey stories. Uh, I've enjoyed Madam Chair hearing stories about your incredible family, uh, as well as uh, Chippy's not in the room, but a very cute dog, and I can't wait to see pictures of Commissioner O'Brien's new member of the household. Um, you know, I. This has been incredible, and I, I want everybody on this team to um, always realize the incredible work that you do in bringing a new industry to Massachusetts, and that you are really helping afford a number of our fellow residents the chance to go to work, and you're affording a number of small businesses across the Commonwealth that really have incredible new opportunities to work with our licensees. and. Uh, that's so important. You should all take great pride that you're really making that happen every day for uh, for folks across the state. Um, as Commissioner Cameron said, this is um, not farewell, um, even though my commute is probably going to go in the opposite direction um, uh, when we all return to office space, but um, it's not a farewell and uh, it's simply, uh, an, you know, until we see each other again. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Commissioner Stevens.
So with the roast that, comes later. Pardon me? The roast comes later. Well, yeah, I bet um, you're you're writing them as we as we speak, Commissioner Cameron. Uh, so, um, if you will, um, I'm going to allow or ask Commissioner Stebbins to make the first little his last official gaming commission motion. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, I move that we adjourn this meeting. I second that. Any objection except that it's to say um, goodbye and thank you for your service your integrity your fidelity and loyalty and with that roll call vote commissioner cameron aye commissioner o'brien aye commissioner zuniga aye commissioner late i vote yes commissioner stebbins <laughs> Yes, I. And with that. Thank you, everybody. That's five zero. Thank you, everyone.